Yeah, I've won a couple of national titles, a couple okay, of state titles. Yeah, we'll bring those up too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my name is Josh Saunders. I'm 25 from Sydney. Lived, born, bred, always in the West. Um, West is best. Mm-hmm. Anything over the bridge can go fuck itself. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I started at a very young age in athletics. Um, I was rugby league from four or five, soccer before that. Um, yeah, I, I, it was a funny story. I finished my um, my first season season of soccer, and I enjoyed it. I had some teammates and some friends and stuff what like age that. Is that. I think I was like four or five, yeah. and um, I came home, got my participation trophy and whatever else they were doing it back then. It's stupid, but um, came back at the end of the season. I said to mum, "When do I get to tackle somebody?" And she goes, "Okay, we'll we'll put you in league. You got to wear shoulder pads. You got to wear headgear. You got to wear mouth guard." She was worried I was going to get hurt, but. The reality was I was the one doing the hurting, which is fucking hilarious. Were you a big kid or a small kid? I was a fucking, I was a pretty big kid. Yeah. I was small at birth. Yeah. I think I was only like six pounds or something. Six pounds. And I don't really know how big that is in terms of children. Uh, I don't, my daughter, I think, was 4.3. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't super big. Like I've heard of kids being like 10 pounds out of the mm. womb and it's like, Jesus Christ. So you're pretty big now. What do you, how tall are you? Uh, 120 and I'm 6'4". Right, yeah, that's a big Yeah, deal. I, um... I ate a lot of sweet potato when I was growing up. Apparently, I had natural steroids in it. So really? I, I don't know. That's just what I got told. I get on those. Um, no, I get on the real ones. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I finished my first season of soccer, and I was I was kind of you know it didn't it wasn't my thing, yeah. and I was like rugby league's my thing. I watch it all the time. I'm obsessed with it. So I played that for uh, just over 17 years. I went from SG Ball at uh, North Sydney Bears to under 20s at South. So I was the only kid to go from the North Sydney development program uh, of the SG ball to the South Sydney team. It was four kids selected to try out. I was the only one who made it. Um, I played two years under 20s at South uh, and then I got a deal to go to Canberra for preseason for the NRL. I went down there, packed up all my stuff, moved down there, um, got told that I wasn't needed for the rest of the season in the car park after training Wow! by the talent manager. Wow. And you that like contract or anything? Uh, I was on a preseason contract, so just a training trial. So they paid you whatever it was, like a thousand bucks a week. You go down, train and stuff like that. But after tax, rent, food and all the rest of it, you're only earning like 500 bucks a week. I think I got paid like 2,100 a month. It was fucking so shit. Yeah. Um, so I did that, came back to Sydney, packed up all my stuff, um, played New South Wales Cup for Mounties, um, just around the corner in like mm-hmm. Liverpool and had a pretty good season. But the thing at Canberra kind of really pissed me off. And I was like, it doesn't matter how much effort you put in. It doesn't matter how much extra work that you do. You're still at the liberty of somebody else. And it really put a, like a foul taste in my mouth. Mm. And I'm like, as we'll go through in my business, like I'm all about personal responsibility and taking accountability and everything's your fault. I don't think fault is a, a negative sense of the word. I think that I think that's super important. And, and a lot of people put too much negative emphasis on fault. Yeah. And it's the same thing as selfishness. I don't believe selfishness to be negative. Yeah. Whatsoever. Bro, these two exact points you're just talking about, on the way here, I was talking to my friend on the phone. No way. I literally said those two things because I just heard it from, uh, I was listening to a podcast, Andrew Tate and the King. Elf Boys. The goat. And I swear to God, like I had a bit of a long day yesterday where I, I drove, it took me an hour and 40 to get home from work. I was yeah. pissed off. And then I had to do something and then my cousin called me, come pick him up from training. Mm-hmm. And he's like, can you drop off my mate? And I was like, oh, bro, I don't want to fucking drop anyone off. I just want to yeah. get home. I was, I was being a little bit of a grunk to him, but we're close like that, so it's yeah, all right. Yeah. Long story short, I drop off his, his mate, I get home, and then this morning I messaged him. I was like, you know what, sorry, I was being a bit of a grunk yesterday. Mm. And I listened to a podcast, Andrew Tate said, everything's your fault, or yeah. it's your responsibility. All the choices you made led you there. Yeah. And I was like, I chose to work at that place. I chose to come live here. Exactly. Long day is my fault. I said, sorry for projecting that on you. Yeah. His 16 year old kid probably just laughed yeah. at it. But, and then I told my mate on the phone that this morning, I was like, but Andrew Tate's fucking, his word's gospel right now in that yeah, sense man. that, fuck, everything's my responsibility. Personal responsibility can never be a bad thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Never. Never. Like a lot of people live a reactionary lifestyle. They just react to things in their life and they're just at the whim. It's like what he talks about with the Forrest Gump at the start. He just mm. blows the feather in the wind and he just, whatever, wherever life takes him is wherever life takes him. And I like, I refuse to live by that. I, I refuse to not take personal responsibility in every single given situation. And this kind of leads in as to why I found jujitsu and I became obsessed so quickly is because it's a team sport as a training, but it's a, comp- a, a completely individualistic competition. Everything is your fault. If you lose, you fucked up somewhere. 
Mm. If you lose, you didn't train hard enough. If you lose, you didn't eat well enough. If you lose, you didn't sleep well enough. On the rugby league field, it could be your hooker misses a tackle. It could be your winger came in fucking off a bender, which was happening at pretty high levels. Like I won't name and shame and anything like that, but it still happens even like New South Wales Cup level. And that started to really piss me off. It's like, why am I putting in all the extras, going to the gym sessions, making sure I'm doing all the right stuff and not getting the chocolates for that rewards. And it really started to fuck with me a little bit. So I was like, you know what? Footy's done. I'm going to retire. I came off. um, What age were you there? 21. Yeah, Came off two big surgeries. So I had a right ankle surgery where my knee was facing this way and my ankle was facing that way. That was really fun. And I did my Liz Frank ligament 366 days after. Where's that? Uh, in your foot on my left side. So it's a foot that creates the arch in your foot, yeah. uh, the ligament rather, that creates the arch in your foot. And they said I'd never have an arch in my foot again, but now it's back to normal. So I don't know, Western medicine, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, so that they were two contributing factors. And then also the, dis- the distaste for team competition and team sport. I'm just like, you know what? I like this personal responsibility stuff. I've been listening to personal development and all this sort of stuff since I was 14. Uh, I want to be able to take action on this. Let me try and find a sport that I enjoy. So I did powerlifting for a little bit. I never competed, got really strong, but it's boring. Mm. The same three lifts over and over again. It's very monotonous. And um, one day in the lockdown, the first lockdown in Sydney, my mate Zach said to me, he goes, you should come over. We're going to do a a rolling session because the gym has been closed down for so long. We got the shit, so we want to train. And as a footy player, you you have a little bit of that. A little bit, yeah. Just a little bit of background into like proprioception, which means how your body moves, how your body feels. Like I'm I'm not a natural athlete. I built myself into an athlete. Although everyone on TikTok and Instagram will tell you that I'm a fucking cheater and I'm a a natural athlete, a gifted and talented. I don't believe in these things. I don't believe in gifted, natural or talented. I don't believe in any of those things. Even at like some highest levels where there could be some... I guess you could have some attributes that are gifted, but you're born with like genetical things. They still have to actualize it. Okay. I've, I've seen very, very gifted and talented athletes completely fall off the wagon. And I've seen what hard work looks like on top of gifted and talented. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's that's the point. big that's delineation. Yeah. Uh, like I'll shout him out. Cam Murray is the consummate professional. I've never seen somebody work their fucking ass off so hard and so diligently and also be what people would perceive as gifted and talented like he had all of the attributes he was strong fast intelligent very very smart knew the game studied the game but they're all skills you develop those skills whether you like them or not yes people have natural aptitudes towards being fast no one's going to be as fast in the 100 meter as Usain Bolt because he's got this weird lanky body that works on leverages and points like that but he still had to hone his craft it could be people out there like that who didn't. Who, who never did sprint. My mind went to like LeBron James, for example. Yep. Six, eight, 200 and whatever pounds. And yeah. He, he's that fast, jumps that high, moves so light. But mm-hmm. there's probably people out there with that same frame yeah. who didn't work on it. I was like, you know, yeah, who never worked on it, who yeah. never, or who did work on it, uh, only up until the point where they could beat the people around them. That's what I saw a lot in rugby league. They did enough to get by and then they stopped. Whereas people like Cam Murray kept going and going and going and going and going, where he's 19 playing in the fucking NRL. Like you don't just, these aren't intangible things. And this is the point that I always go to people. They're not intangibles that you can't work on yourself. They are skills that you must develop. Like sport is about tactics more than anything. More than, more than anything. You have, you have the fastest, strongest, most powerful, ridiculous athletes on a team, but they can't communicate to each other. How useful is that? Mm. It's not. There's zero use to that. Or they can communicate to each other, but they're all Gumbies. <laughs> there's, there's no, you know what I mean? You have to have a little bit of both. Yeah. But in my opinion, I would rather live in a world where I believe personal responsibility is the biggest factor and that I everything I do is my fault, which means my strength is my fault, my skill set is my fault, my cardio is my fault. And fault's not a negative connotation. Not at yeah. all. It, it's, it's all my fault. So whether you, well, like whether people on the internet like it or not, um, I get this comment all the time. They're like, oh, you're just bigger and stronger than everyone. I was like, yeah, how the fuck do you think I got that? I, I worked my ass off for 11 years in the gym, never had one week off in 11 years. I used to do, this is a funny story. When I was training at North Sydney Bears, I would go to the training session early. I would train in the gym session at the rugby league team um, session. We'd train on the field afterwards and then I'd go to any time on the way home. I get two cheeseburgers from the drive through for a little bit of fucking carbs and fats mm-hmm. and whatever. And then I'd go and do another hour and a half session. What position were you? Uh, back then I was playing center and then I moved into second row and then I moved into prop. But I just kept getting bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger and less fast and, and less agile. Um, you're doing more than everyone else. 
Yeah. 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 By a long shot. I was doing two, two sessions a day, minimum seven days a week. Fuck. Minimum. Like I was fucking obsessed. If I wasn't going to be the biggest and the strongest and the ugliest, I was going to be the hardest worker. And I ended up being a little bit of both up until a point, uh, up until I sort of got disheartened and stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, what is this worth my time? Started to really have like a, a long, hard look in the mirror whether rugby league was actually going to be my thing. Um, and I told a story about this in my course that I'm doing. Um, I used to live in a house in Rouse Hill. There was two trees in the front yard. I used to kick goals off a tee and stuff like that and pretend I was winning like state of origin or some shit. And I'm like, oh, wow. And you have the crowd go off in your head. And it was kind of disheartening because I got to a stage in rugby league where that wasn't going to happen anymore. Like, first of all, a prop's not fucking kicking goals <laughs> unless you're um, Takiaho and he's pretty yeah. good. But um, secondary to that, I started to realize that that dream was kind of slipping away a little bit yeah. um, for whatever reason. But um, I actually achieved that dream in my own head this year when I went to ADCC in September. There was 12,000 people sold out, grappling tournament, massive crowd, really cool atmosphere. And I walked on and I kind of almost took myself out of the moment a little bit because I was like, fuck, I actually did it. Yeah. Crazy. I was like, maybe... 11 or 12 when this was happening when i was kicking goals through the trees and 12 or 13 years later i'm fucking doing it in a different way exactly yeah, yeah. And, and conor mcgregor has the same story he goes talks about being a football player yeah, yeah. talks about it with ariel Juan. He was in the stadium and he goes now i'm in the ufc and i'm doing the same thing and i think that people judge themselves too heavily on their initial thought and they sort of let that go and then they slip into this quiet despair yeah. and they don't they never pursue it anymore well, who gave you the keys to the kingdom of the universe and who told you that you could predict the future yeah. you know what i mean you just have to keep working in the direction every fucking day and who knows what can happen you know what i mean so yeah that's that's pretty much the backstory um yeah, i do i want to go back to when you're before you continue on to how you got into bjj mm -hmm. but when you were 14 you said is when you started to get into that personal development and yeah and start listening to things how what was your first encounter and how did that happen because that's a young age good question good question um eric thomas and les brown were the two things that i listened to the most when i first got into it are um, they from the states are they yeah they're from america they're two they're two like they're almost like church guys you know when you see the big churches in america and they like rev people up they're kind of like that they're like colloquial motivational speakers um they've done things like les brown uh oh, eric thomas sorry is the guy who's famous for saying the um the guy that wants to be a millionaire he goes to the he, he tells the story about this guy and he goes up to him and he goes i want to be a millionaire he goes, all right i'll show you how to be a millionaire you see me tomorrow 4 a.m at the beach meets this guy at the beach dressed up in a suit all nice tries to impress the guy he goes all right let's walk to the water and he goes what the fuck is this guy doing so he walks him down to the water and um he goes all right get in he goes, you're fucking serious? I'm in a suit. He goes, I don't care. Get in. So he walks in the water, gets to the water, keeps going, keeps going. He's about waist deep. He goes, well, we're, we're still going. Gets him head deep and then just dunks his head. Holds him down there. He's like thrashing around and everything. Brings him up and he goes, as bad as you want to breathe right now, that's how bad you want fucking success. He goes, that's how bad you have to want it because otherwise it's never going to happen. And I don't super agree with like that's how bad you need it but it's a nice illustration mm. um and that was pretty much my first encounter i used to watch youtube videos on it all the time um i have this i have this weird sort of esoteric thing where i believe i've been here before i know people I've, i feel like i've heard that story before yeah yeah, yeah. people always say this and it, it depends like it depends on what you believe in right like reincarnation or god or allah it doesn't really matter to me as long as you believe in something um, but I definitely believe like my whatever soul or energy or whatever, like this meat suit is powered by. I just, I genuinely believe it's been here before. I get told by everybody that I'm more mature than I sound for my age. Um, and I've been told that on an age of spectrum of like people who are 16 to 60 and they always say the same thing. So I don't know if that's, that's just the way that I'm choosing to see it. Um, it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks, but I think, um, I think I was meant to be doing what I'm meant to be doing right now. And that was just a piece of the puzzle along the way where you don't really hear many 14 year olds going and listening to personal development and reading books and stuff yeah. like that. I got into the gym at the same age. Um, and those two things go hand in hand. And it's funny because you, you think about it in, in a sense of on every TV show and every sitcom, every movie, the big Jack guy is the dumb dude. He's the retard. He's the bubbling idiot. Cause he's got all these muscles and none of these brains. It's actually the fucking opposite in real life. In real life, the guys who take care of themselves and are jacked out of their brains are usually fucking pretty intelligent. Mm. There's a very minute part of the population that is stupid because you have to be willing to forego immediate pleasure for the long-term gain for a long, long time yeah. before you see any sort of substantial results. What is that akin to in every other part of your life? 
business, everything. relationship, everything. It's it's it it posts itself across everything. And Miyamoto Miyamoto Masashi says the same thing. He goes, once you learn the way in in one thing, you learn the way in all things. You realize that specialization and mastery in any subject is the exact same way that you do it in every other it's subject. Applied to everything, yeah. It can always be applied. So everybody asks me. Um, how I got so good at jiu-jitsu so fast and I'm like well I played 17 years of rugby league I've done 11 years of personal development and I've done 11 years in the gym so really I've got 35 years of experience in jiu-jitsu and they go oh I never thought about it like that I was like the fact that you don't think about it like that means to me that you haven't really fully dedicated yourself to something yet like, it's not that you can't get there but it just means that you haven't done it yet the way that you see it is you go fucking balls to the walls because most people i really like this quote most people go an inch deep mile wide do the opposite an inch deep mile wide yep go a, go a mile deep but an inch wide so you hone in yeah. exactly yeah. and go yeah. fucking hard yeah and there's a i even said it on a consult call yesterday to one of my clients he's a young fella kai and um there's that photo that goes around on Instagram every couple of years where the guy is digging for gold and he's like just that far away, but he gives up and the other guy keeps going and he actually hits it. That's for everything. Mm. That's, that's for everything. People will experience resistance after the joy of an, an, an initial period of joy. Like when you pick up a new subject, it's very exciting. I'm sure when you started this podcast, I'm like, fuck, this is going to be so <laughs> cool. It's going to be yeah, mad. Editing, I'll, I'll do oh, editing. You get like three months in, you're like, fuck, am I I'm really going to do this? <laughs> and then you push past that initial period of whatever time it might, it might be. And jujitsu, this is, this is fucking standard. You get bashed as a white belt. You feel like you're drowning above water. The people that make it past that usually get to blue belt. The people that make it past blue belt uh, usually get to purple belt. It's, it's, there's a 90% there's a rate of white belts to blue but then there's only 10% of blue belts who make it to purple. There's a huge attrition rate at blue belt. And I'm trying to figure out why. For, for my opinion, most people just get to a stage where they realize one sense of achievement, I'm not a beginner now. So now I can quit. Mm. That's what most people do in most things. It goes to what you were saying in your goal setting podcast is your first or second mm. episode where you set the goal, but you only set it to a certain point and you don't set it past it. So they said, okay, I'm going to get to one build up or... I want to get off white belt. Yeah. And then what's next once I get that? Well, I think chasing outcomes is a frivolous task anyway. I think you should set your life up in a way where you commit to daily actions that are going to move you move the needle forwards and you just do that every single day. Because if you keep progressing forwards, I say it all the time, it's one of my favorite quotes, if you walk west from Sydney, eventually you must hit Perth. There's no way that you can't. The only delineation is you walking west and the time that it's going to take you. But if I said to you right now, this podcast blows up into the third or fifth biggest podcast in the world, you make $10 million a year. Do you give a fuck how long that takes? Mm. <laughs> Absolutely not. Could take six years, could take 20 years. It doesn't matter. But if I told you that that was the result that you were after and you could do it, you just had to keep working in the same direction for a long enough period of time, you could make it happen. And black belt's no different. A $10 million business is no different. Uh, having the physique of your dreams is no different. Building yourself into a fucking valuable person is no different. You just have to keep marching in the same direction again and again and again until you get there. But then you would have developed the character traits of the person who continues to do that. And you see it all the time. People always ask me, um, or they, they don't ask me, but that people commonly say this. They say, why do billionaires keep trying to earn money? And I'm like, because they're not outcome focused like you. That's the reason they are billionaires. They created habits and f knowledge and wisdom and skills in their life that is perpetuated on a day-to-day -day basis that it's irrelevant about the outcome. They are committed to actions every single day of progressing and moving forwards so much so that it's not about the outcome. So the skills and the habits and the stuff that they perform every single day is the reason they have the outcome, but it's not the reason they are doing it. They've committed every single day to my thing is like progress and excellence. If you commit to progress and excellence every single day, there's why couldn't you have every single thing you've ever dreamt of? Mm. It's you know it's kind of stupid to to me to think that if you kept moving in those two directions, you would never have everything. Doesn't make sense otherwise. Can we use that as an example to like for a common example like going to the gym? So if we relate that billionaire uh, example, how? Yeah, well, people people always say that, don't they? They go, why are you at the gym? You're finished. Mm. <laughs> You've already built a crazy physique. You're already really strong. And it's like, well, that's not the point, right? Because first of all, that person doesn't see it from where you are. They have higher expectations than you see. The, the whole thing of like, um, if you aim for the moon, you'll land somewhere along, along the stars. If you aim for the sky, you'll stay on earth, blah, 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 blah. You have to find a way to put, not unrealistic, but 
far-reaching expectations on top of yourself and say, you know what, what am I capable of? What do you, what do I think I'm capable of? The people who think they're capable of earning 100 grand a year will probably earn 50 grand a year. The people who think they're capable of earning 50 grand a month will probably earn 20 grand a month. It's just the way that it looks. People who think they're capable of benching 200 kilos might bench 160. But the people who think they can only bench 100 will probably only bench 80 because they're not setting the bar high enough. They're not stretching themselves to achieve these sorts of things. I think that's really important. I, in jiu-jitsu, have the perfect example of that because I'm a brown belt within 23 months and that's never been done before to my knowledge. Um, there's been some guys, I think BJ Penn is probably the only one that can be close to that. Um, but I think to my knowledge, I'm one of a handful of people, if ever, who's done that. Um, I'm one of an even smaller handful of people who've done it with no previous combat sport experience. And I never said to myself, no, I never said I couldn't do it. I heard of a guy who did four years to black belt. His name's Kit Dale. He's an Australian grappler. And I went, fuck it. Why not? Why not? And I think the more you ask why not instead of why, I think the better results you get because people will go, oh, yeah, but it takes people an average of eight to 10 years, blah, 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 blah. Maybe I can't train as much as I want to or maybe this will happen or maybe I'll get injured. They start to reason with themselves for their own limitations. It's so funny. You point this out to people and you say, you are actually fighting for your own limitations here. You are fighting me to tell me why you suck. It's a state of just trying to be not uncomfortable, isn't it? I, I think, think so. so. I think that's an not element of it. Not wanting to disappoint yourself. I think a fear of failure yeah. is a better way to put it. I think people are genuinely terrified of failing and that goes to the scholastic system where effort is not rewarded. It's the outcome that is rewarded. So if you get an A on the test, you get a gold star. If you get a B on the test, you get less of a gold star. If you get a C, F, whatever, your parents punish you because you didn't get the right grades. In my opinion, effort should always be rewarded. If you try and you attempt to do something and it doesn't work, you still win because you fucking put the effort behind it and you you did what you needed to do and it didn't come out. But the outcome isn't the reason you should be doing things. It's the action. How do we, like, there's got to be a fine line, but because, you know, the, like the participation awards they give out now. The but that's not rewarding like, effort. That's just... Re that's rewarding okay. participation. If I see you giving effort, I will reward it. Like I do this in jiu-jitsu all the time. If a white belt or a blue belt is rolling with me, they get the unfortunate circumstance where they make eye contact across the mats and they fucked up. They looked at me, they have to roll me now. Um, if I can see them putting in a shit ton of effort, I will always say to them, you're moving really well. Like you're doing the right things. I'm just a, I'm just a step ahead. Yeah. And I, 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 deserve, I deserve to be a step ahead. I fucking carved the path. I've, I've trained more in two years than most people train in six. How the fuck else am I meant to not be ahead? Like, I do 13 sessions a week. How do you do that? Cunt. <laughs> How the fuck do you do that? Um, I've just built it into my lifestyle. I don't, accept, I don't accept mediocrity. I refuse to accept it. Everybody goes, oh, how do you do that? I was like, well, first of all, I built it from three to five to eight to 10, then to 13 eventually. It was a gradual, slow, long process. Um, it wasn't this thing where I just did it, bang, 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 bang. Um, but I want to be as good as I possibly can be through the method of progress and excellence. And you've built a life around you that allows you to do that. Yeah, exactly right. I had this guy, <laughs> had this guy on TikTok and he said to me, he goes, you're lucky to have enough money to be able to train all day, every day. And I said, the way that you have constructed that sentence means you will never, ever achieve anything great. And some people will say that's harsh, but it's true. It's, it's true. If you think like that, if you think that somebody is more genetically gifted than you and that's the reason that they're better than you, you're a fucking idiot. And you're never going to achieve anything in your life. I can say that. I can say that confidently because I know people that achieve shit. I've studied it for 11 years. I've, I've looked at like the people on these walls, like Kobe Bryant, um, fuck Sonny Bill, Tommy like Man, Tom Bill? Brady. Yeah, he's all right. He plays for the wrong fucking team. Um, but these people, they, they, don't, they don't limit themselves in their own mind. They don't have a piece of fucking flesh between their ears that is working against them. It works for them. And they figure out how to do that. And I think for me personally, it's violent action towards what you want. If you have so much evidence behind you for the fact that you can do something, how can you not be confident in pulling that off every single day? Like if you did, if you and I did this 4,000 times, do you reckon the 4,000th time it would be fucking so much better than the first? 100%. Absolutely. So why is that different to anything else? Why is that reality not so easy to see in everything else my opinion because you have to go through the shit mm. not many people are not many people are geared to go through the shit to deal with rejection to deal with uh, failure to deal with all these obstacles and all these bits and pieces that come up 
between them saying what they want and between them doing what is necessary to get there. And you see it time and time again. People say they want to lose weight. How much do you want to lose weight? Do you want to lose weight in a convenient way? Because that's not how you lose weight. Or do you just want the magic pill? Nine times out of 10, they want the magic pill. And guess what? It fucking doesn't exist. The magic pill is called hard work. Mm. And whether you're willing to admit that or not is the difference between you actually getting there or not. Super simple. So if you had someone that's fresh, which I'm sure that happens um, with the consulting stuff you do and Mm -hmm. your team, how do you start gearing them to think like that or to start acting like that? Thank Christ. I'm not really getting anybody who's brand new anymore, which is really, really good. And I I do say that in my marketing. I say I want people who are doing 85% of the work already who need the extra 15% and they just don't know how to get it. That's why it's high performance, not average performance. I'm not interested in getting fucking Sally eight kilos of weight loss for her wedding. I just, I could not be fucked. (laughs) Fat loss clients are the worst people on earth because they will do nothing and then they will blame you. It's just, it's just a punish. So, um, but in terms of mindset, I get a lot of people who don't think like me, obviously. And everybody says, oh, you think a certain way and it's really cool. And it's strange to me because I just think this way. Well, like you said as well, you didn't do it. You're studying this stuff for 11 years. Yeah. You introduced to it at 14. Like mm. It's not like you just wake up one day or see one TikTok and you can start thinking like not that. Not at all. Not What's at all. Time? I've cultivated this over a decade, mm. decade plus, and it's going to be a continuation of the same thing that in, if we talk in 30 years time, I'll be doing the same thing. I've committed to that as a daily action and I refuse to give it up for any reason. Um, but if someone is listening to this and they're like, fuck, I want to think like the guy the, the, the speaking right now, like this fucking ogre on camera. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a simple thing and it's the same methodology that I use for getting good at jujitsu. It's the same methodology I use for getting good at speaking another language. Not that I do that, but it's, it's the same thing for learning how to cook a good meal. It's the exact same thing. You have to be willing to suck at the start. Not a lot of people are willing to do that. Not a lot of people are willing to pick something up and let's say ping pong, for instance, something inconsequential. They pick up ping pong and then they watch ping pong videos about how good these bloody Asian guys are in the Olympics and they go, fuck, well, I'll never be as good as that. The reason that you said, the reason you'll never be as good as that is because you said that. All the guys that are on video that are doing high level performance in sport, in business, in anything, they sucked ass at the beginning and they were willing to go from suck to shit from shit to bad, bad to okay, okay to good, good to great. You just don't see it, but because all you see is the end outcome. And exactly. We'll go back to basketball because I watch a lot of basketball. Or actually, we'll go like do- you see it in documentaries. I think mm-hmm. that's why when documentaries or biographies come out, it's so mm-hmm. powerful. Because, like, for example, the Kanye West one, mm-hmm. when he's walking around and fucking no one knows him and he's at this party, he's like, yo, I'm Ye West or Kanye West. Was it Jamie Foxx's party, wasn't it? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. I might have been. I think Joe Rogan talks about that. Yeah. Yeah. But he, you see like just a normal guy. Yeah. Who was probably, obviously was crazy talented at the time, but obviously not at the level he was now. And he would have sucked shit, ate a lot of shit at that time. And then you see him get better and better and better. And now you see him as yay. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so powerful because it, it's more relatable when you see the shit behind the scenes that you wouldn't normally see. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it's crazy to me that people watch that and they still go, nah, yeah, that, that he stuff, was lucky. That stuff you watch but makes you feel like you can do it. Yeah. And it should. Yeah, and I think I think that's why I do so much of what I do and I want to share the lessons, the knowledge and the experience and stuff that I've gone through. And I listen to this guy in business. His name's Alex Hormozzi. He's a really, really good business guy. And he says, I wish that Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these guys documented the yeah, entire journey. That would be mad. I wish that you could see the inner sanctum of Amazon as it was being built in year one, year two. Because you see that photo of yeah. Amazon, the 1997. Yeah. Always goes viral. But I used to have that on my wall. Really? When I first started HPU, I printed that out and I put it on my wall. And I was like, I'm going to fucking make this happen. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in the same stratospheric gain from where he was in 1997, where he's literally spray painted Amazon on the wall on a fucking tarp or something. Mm. And now he's one of the richest guys in the world, has one of the biggest companies in the world. Now, I don't necessarily want to have one of the biggest companies in the world, but I want to make as big of an impact as that has happened. And, and that's also relative to where you are and what you sort of put in and the effort that you sort of deliver. Um, but I think you're exactly right. I think putting that into perspective and saying, you know what? Amazon's this crazy fucking company right now, but where did they start? Where did they fuck up? There's actually a really good series on Prime. Oh, fuck. What is it called? I don't remember what, it, what it's called. It's about Uber. Okay. It's about the start of Uber. And one of my good mates, Isaac, put me onto it. And it's um, 
about how they started and all the hiccups that they ran into and they were going to get taken off the app store at one point because they were sharing user data and they were oh. like blocking um, Lyft and stuff like that when they started coming up as well. Is it like more documentary or movies? More of like a TV series. Kind it's more of like, like a docudrama. The Facebook one? Kind of, yeah, 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 kind of. But it's really interesting because you see all the hiccups behind the scene and you just think that Uber exists. Mm, yeah, you just yeah, think, yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah. exists now and I can use well, some it. Some rich can put money to an app and yeah. Salt Lake City and now they got this. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I, I like the I like the hero's journey story and that at the basis of every level, that is the story. It's like superheroes. Like you got the Captain America shield behind me. The hero is born. They don't realize how powerful they are. They run into some sort of problem. They get defeated by the problem. They come back with new skills and then they defeat the problem at the end. Every fucking superhero movie on earth is the same way, it's except where line. except where old mate Thanos fucking wins the first. But in the second part, That's they had to make it in so two movies. Part. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. But they put it into two movies and it's still the same story arc. Yeah. Like I pretty much ruined every superhero movie ever. <laughs> but um, it's the same thing. And, and if you play that on a, a one-to-one scale of your own life, Let's say you started playing, uh, started selling shoes. At the first, you get a couple, you get a couple sales, and you do really well, and then it drops off for no reason. You don't know why. And you're like, "What the fuck's going on? What mm-hmm. what what happened with this?" And then you realize that it's just part of the journey. Nothing's linear in life. Absolutely nothing. It's not going to be sunny for seven days in a row every week. It's just not going to happen. Some days are going to rain. Some days are going to be windy. It's going to be cold, miserable. Unless you're in Dubai. <laughs> Unless you're in Dubai. Or unless you live in London, it's fucking rainy and miserable, <laughs> disgusting all the time, every day. Or in Australia. Or in Australia, exactly right. But it's not going to always be the way that it is. And I think if people can get that through their head, that nothing is perpetual. As, as humans, we're psychologically bred to think that this is going to go on forever. We think that life is going to go on forever. We think we have all the time in the world. And you wake up and you're 35. And you're like, what the fuck happened? What's, what's going on here? You have a kid and you see it, it's like, what the fuck? Yeah, exactly right. But I think that most people live their lives like that. They mo- Most people live their lives like, oh, I could do it tomorrow. I could do it on Monday. Y- you know Monday doesn't actually exist. Mm. It's only fucking right now. True. The future doesn't exist and the past doesn't exist. And people live in quite desperation because of those two f- places. They live in anxiety of the future and they live in fucking fear of the past because they're like, oh, like I made that mistake before. I don't want to do that again. I don't want to relive those lessons. I can't wait to fuck shit up. Cannot wait because I get to learn something about myself I didn't know beforehand. I can't wait. It's the fucking best thing ever. That's why jiu-jitsu is so attractive to me because if I fuck a move up, guess whose fault it is? It's my fault. And now I realize that I did something that was wrong or not necessarily wrong, but I did something that wasn't the way that I wanted to do it. How do I fix that? I work at it and I get better and better and better and better. I had a recent competition where I made a mistake tactically and it's one of those things where I start to cruise through matches. I only really give people second or third gear and that was a fault in my mindset and I ended up losing a decision. I don't fucking accept that. That's my fault. That's my responsibility. Everybody goes, oh yeah, he did some good things. I was like, no, no, no. I just didn't do enough. That, that was on me. Like I didn't play the game well enough. I didn't use my time effectively enough and I didn't capitalize on positions. And now I've gone back into the training room and for the post the past two weeks off those times, every round has been 100% go. And I'm going to continue to do that until it's second nature in competition, which I believe that it is because training is the same as competition. In fact, training is more important than competition. Everybody thinks that getting a fucking $2 medal at the end of a comp is the most important thing, and it's, it's fucking not, especially if you don't prepare. Like, the what's that saying I was using the other week? You don't rise to the occasion, you fall to your level of preparation. Mm-hmm. That's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Because if you, th- if you really let that sink in, you'll never lose ever again. I was thinking, full thinking about that today. Not that level, but... My- so my little cousin plays Howard Mounts right now. Yeah, and who for? Uh, Dragons. Nice. And he's, he's got a hammy in injury, but they're doing slopes today. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, fuck, you, although you got a hammy injury, you need to make sure, he's like talking about how they died, they got smashed. Like you mm. need to make sure you get that in before you start playing. Because that's a shit that the great people, everyone's good on the field. Mm-hmm. The great people can do it when they're fucked. Yeah. At the end of the game, when it's close, who, you're tired, who's going to rise, to, not rise to the occasion, who's still got it? Yep. Exactly. Like, you need to make sure you get those sessions in before you like the season starts because it's so important. Yeah. You need to kill yourself beforehand. You need to get yourself in the most disgustingly ridiculous place in training to realize that anything in the game is no longer a, a problem. And Adesanya and see the kickboxing and Volkanovski yeah. do it. They, oh, what do they call it? They're Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Before a week or two, a couple of weeks before the fight, where yeah. they just kill themselves. So yep. they know 
when I get in the cage. Fresh in the mind. Yeah. Bro, I had a shark tank at um, Souths, and I was just started training with the NRL. It was Tom Burgess, Sam Burgess, Greg Inglis, and me. Fuck. And we stood on four corners, and there was one person in the middle. I actually, there, there might have been another person. There was one on each corner, and they would run at you. They wouldn't tell you who it was, and they just run. They just go. And you had to get double unders and put them on the ground for three seconds before the next fresh person would come in. And you have to do all four people before they let you out of the circle. And everybody was a cunt about it. Everyone. Because in an NRL team, most people don't realize, like, yes, your teammates, yes, your friends, but this motherfucker's trying to take my spot. Yeah, He's trying to take my contract. And if I articulate it like that, it's true. So if you're going up against the big wigs, you've got to fucking prove yourself. But at the end of the day, the opposition's not going to go soft on you. Absolutely not. you're preparing for. Absolutely not. So mm. it's a, that high-level competitive advantage. And it's, it's the same thing in jiu-jitsu. Like we have a bit of a joke in jiu-jitsu that I win drilling. And you're not really meant to win drilling because you're meant to drill the technique and learn the technique. But even then, I, I think that that breeds a certain level of weakness. Yeah. And I don't think – like I haven't been scored on, apart from when I went to ADCC – uh, against Philippe Penner, I haven't been scored on in 47 matches in a row. I've only had 63 matches. Wow. Like, I think I've been scored on a total of four times. Let's talk about what you got going in now and then we'll get into B- BJJ. So yeah, yeah, let's do that. scoring and stuff like that because yeah. I don't. Um, but you got a couple of business streams running right now. You got your consulting. Yeah, yeah so I do, I do personal training. Oh, well, it's not even really called personal training anymore. I fucking don't know what to call it. Hey, I, I just get people to do what they say and say what they do. Everybody goes, oh, you do a bit of life coaching. I'm like, fuck, don't put me in that group of fucking homos that do life coaching. They suck. I'm not going to tell you to sun your balls and fucking sniff sunflower seeds yeah. <laughs> and uh, manifest all your world's desires. Not that that stuff isn't useful in some circles, um, but basically I get I get people to perform better than they thought they previously could have um, by removing all the bullshit in their head. Is that through communication or they come to a gym? or uh, That's all online. Okay. Yeah, so, so I, I, I moved WhatsApp out groups and stuff. Yeah, exactly right. So I moved out of the um, the in person personal training space for a couple of reasons. Um, PTs are dickheads. Yep, <laughs> they're just dickheads. They're like real estate agents. They're fucking, selfish. Yeah, I, not even selfish, but just egotistical and and not deservedly so. Like if you walked into LeBron James and he was a bit of an egotistical cunt, it's like you know what you've earned it you, you've you've earned it yeah. that makes sense um but yeah my i just fault. didn't yeah exactly my fault yeah my fault that i'm seeing him that way exactly yeah. right and and that's that's something to be said to be honest like people people seem to think that i'm arrogant or something like that and it's like okay well that if that if if my level of addiction to what i want to make happen intimidates you that's your fault mm. not mine i would rather be perceived arrogant and get everything done i want into my life than be perceived as a, a humble person and get nothing done that's how I see it. And then that's what I'm choosing to leave. People might not like it. Couldn't fucking care less. It's your life. Exactly. Simple as that. But yes, yeah, so I do that. Um, I just started a course for jiu-jitsu specifics. Like, like I said, I'm pretty unprecedented by getting a brown belt in 23 months. So that has a certain level of skill set and determination and uh, thought process around it. And there's, there's a lot of things and lessons that I can distill that I've learned through that period of time and started to actualize that I'm starting to teach now. Well, I'm um, back- the belt and ranking so people actually know how hard that is right because not everyone knows what jiu-jitsu is so um white belt is the start blue purple brown black the general consensus of the idea is that white to black belt should take you 10 years um white to blue might take one to two uh purple belt might take you about three to five years brown belt should take you anywhere between six and eight years and then black belt should take anywhere between eight to ten that's the general consensus of the world so i got to the second highest rank in under two years stripes and stuff isn't it yeah so there's every stripe per belt so if you get a white belt you get a stripe before you get promoted you get four stripes per belt um i actually didn't even get a stripe on my purple belt i just went straight to brown who decides this? Your coach, basically. So the, the coach is the only person who has the discretion to be able to promote you. Um, you can become a certain level of undeniable. Um, and I'll explain why. I went 58 and I think I went 57 and two all the way leading up to Brown Belt. Um, submitted 80% of the people that I ever fought. 
didn't get scored on in like over 40 matches, all these sorts of things, like these crazy statistics. And people will go, oh, your fucking belt's not real because you haven't done the required time. It's like, well, do you want me to sit at blue belt and just flog everybody? Like I'm being a sandbagger. You're versing people who are higher belts. Black belts, multiple time national champions, yeah. uh, international champions, all these sorts of people and still beating them. Yeah. So it's it, it's kind of hard. It's like a gray area in the sport. There's no you set see guidelines. Over the last week or whatever, Alex Pereira got his... What did he get? A purple or I think a he got brown? A brown? Yeah, and and then like Islam Makachev was saying on the DC podcast, like, uh, who are giving these guys belts? Like Dustin Poirier, black belt. Like, I mean, so it is a bit of a gray area. Eh? It is a very it's it's very discretionary. It's completely subjective on the coach. Okay, so um, no criteria. Not really. My coach Luke Martin is very discretionary, and if you've earned it, in my opinion, you fucking earned it off him. Um, of course I say that he's my coach if I, if I said that I'd be fucking rubbishing and everything but I do believe what Islam was saying is true mm. most people shouldn't have a black belt it should be very fucking difficult to get a black belt and it really it isn't if you show up to some gyms for 10 years pay your fees you get one like I, I've been in the sport long enough now everybody goes oh you've been in for two years I've been in the sport long enough now I've submitted enough black belts in training I've submitted enough black belts in competition um maybe two of those people have earned theirs in my opinion again who am i i'm not their coach i'm not the one who decides where they are we get purple belts coming to our gym that get fucking slumped by our white belts it's like all right well where'd you get your purple belt from because it's obviously not one yeah. and look horses for courses different criteria for different people and there's never going to be a systematic way to view these things I'm, I'm starting to develop kind of a curriculum in my own head of how i would grade students um given that they show technical proficiency in these areas. I think as you start to get into the higher belt ranks, you should be become more of a leader. There, there's a certain leadership quality to being a black belt or a brown belt, and I, I take that very seriously, especially in my own gym. Um, I like holding people accountable to what they said they were going to do. I like forcing people to get better because you can. Um, even something simple, when at the end of class, when we all circle around, we all go in belt order, we all get into a circle. I don't like seeing people with their hands on their knees after training. And that's a rugby league thing. Yeah. Even yeah. even though the science actually dictates that it's, it's it's better, but I don't like it from a mindset perspective because if you were to do that after a competition round against somebody in a match, and then your next opponent on the side of the bracket is already waiting for you, and they see you put your hands on your knees, they see weakness. And if they think like me, it's like blood in the water for a shark. I'm gonna go fucking a thousand miles at that cunt. And I'm going to beat him mentally. Mm. Like I take mental warfare very, very seriously. Um, when I won ADCC trials in Australia, um, there was a couple of things, and it was really weird because I had so many visions on the way driving to training in the lead up to the in, into the Talk competition about manifestation. Yeah, seeing I, the interview. Yeah, I, I really, I really had this otherworldly sort of sense of focus come over me on that day and i like i walked in to the competition i forgot my passport you have to put a passport in because i have to confirm that you're from australia um so i forgot my passport luckily it was in blacktown i live in seven hills so it was like just a, a suburb away and that didn't even shake me i didn't freak out i didn't do anything like that and i did an interview with one of the boys um and then i walked in and i saw the mats and i was like this is exactly what i thought it was going to be exactly like to the fucking letter like I was thinking about how the energy of the crowd would feel. I was thinking about this thing. And I walked on for my third match. Um, and I don't know how to explain it. It was like this. You know when you're kind of staring at something and your vision goes blurry and you, you know that you're staring at it and you know that you should stop so your vision comes back. I kind of had that. It was like this really weird, intense focus. And I was just staring at the mats. I, was, I do this bounce thing when I warm up. I don't warm up too crazy, but it's kind of like shadow boxing as a boxer, but you're just moving from side to side. You're not moving forwards to back. So you're kind of just moving and bobbing your head. And I was waiting for them to call me on. And I knew that as soon as I touched those mats, I won. Mm. As soon as I touched them, I beat this guy in 45 seconds. He, he beat two guys to face me and I, I fucking took his back and choked him in 45 seconds. That's and I punched my ticket to the finals. And I just, I knew, I just... I knew I've, for six months prior to the event, I was telling people when I win trials, not if, when. I said, in my mind, it's already happened. I'm just waiting for time to catch up. And I said that on the day probably five or six times. And everybody was like, fuck, you're tearing through this division. I was like, yeah, I'm going to win. I'm going to Vegas. I've already booked my flights. And they were like, fuck. And some people, again, some people were like, oh, fucking arrogant, calm, whatever. But I was like, okay, but I'm, I'm willing to put my word on the line because my actions have already backed up my word. 
and I think that's so important. Mm-hmm. I just had a ridiculous amount of certainty that I knew that I was going to fucking make that happen. And then back to the mental warfare thing, the guy who I was versing in the final had already been beaten in the final the two years previous. So he's already used to being a second place winner. I'm like, all right, well, that's that's one win. He's never versed me before. That's another win. He had a nap uh, like an hour and a half before our match. I was like, that's another win. Um, the fourth win was that he was coaching on the day as well. He was like coaching other students um, from his gym. And that takes a lot of energy out of you, whether you like it or not, because it's a very it's a, it's a very chess-minded sort of game. And if you're the one that's instructing your student to be able to perform those moves, you've got to be thinking at a high-level degree of order. I was just watching and enjoying the day and taking in the, the experience of what it was. And You were just there to win. I was there to do my job. The really, really cool serendipitous thing, I, I refuse to say coincidence because I don't believe in coincidence. I think everything is on purpose and where you are is exactly where you're meant to be, are, uh, where you're meant to be. Um, a song played when I play, when I versed a guy at a fight card, it was my first fight card as like a super fight. Uh, it's called Subversion. It was in March uh, of 2020. It was 2022. It was in March of 2022. Anyway, so when I won, I submitted this guy on the back and this song played. I fucking still don't know what the song is, but I remember the song because I've watched the video on my phone hundreds of times where I win and the crowd goes crazy. That song played about 20 minutes before I was going to take the mats for the finals. What the fuck? And it, bro, it was in my head and I was like, it gave me fucking chills. And I was like, I'm going to win this. I was like, there's no doubt in my mind. I'm going to do enough to win this. It doesn't matter how I do it. I don't care how it happens. I'm going to fucking win. And then when my hands gets raised, like you see me drop to my knees and I fucking started crying straight away. Like I was overwhelmed. I was flooded with emotion and I was like, holy shit. This is just the proof that if you fucking keep saying something and you work your ass off towards it, anything can happen. Mm. And I think that my story isn't, it's not special. It's been done thousands of times where people have said they wanted to do something, but it's cool to be another example for more people to be like the personification of what is possible. Because everybody thinks, oh, what's possible? What's doable? Fuck that. Think about the impossible. Think about the craziest story you could ever come up with and then move in that direction for as long as you can. What's your impossible right now? I'm living it. I'm living it. I, like a, my, I don't really have an impossible because I don't believe in it. I don't believe anything is impossible. Well, what's your, like, the, you know, we're talking about what you set your, your goal, even though not outcome based. So, like, like we yeah. Talk, is it the, Vegas and so it's kind of it's kind of a paradox right because I, I kind of make it up as I go but I've committed to a certain amount of daily actions where progress and excellence are the top two tiers of what I do every single day and I'm just marching my businesses forward I'm marching my jiu-jitsu career forward I'm marching my relationships forward everything is moving forward on a day-to-day basis and I don't think that I have a set desired outcome in mind like obviously if I end up being a world champion, that's fucking fantastic. And I think I will be just based on the amount of effort that I'm willing to put in. I think my business is going to be ultimately very successful because of the, the, again, the amount of effort that I'm willing to put in. And I think if you just keep moving in that direction, I don't think, so I'll put it like this. I don't think Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg ever sat there and going to go, I'm going to be worth 40 billion plus dollars at the end of this. I don't think they ever sat there and articulated that to themselves. If you heard Zuck on Joe Rogan, he says, I was just making people connect. I just wanted people to connect. Right. Just making an app, people connect. I didn't know I was going to get to this level. Where exactly. I'm worried about fucking um, censorship and stuff like that. Of course, yeah. of course. And I think he's a good representation of that, whether you think that that was him being a mouthpiece and being very clever with what he was saying. Um, I think there's truth to it. I think there's an element of truth to it as well. I, I think that he is an incredibly intelligent person. There's no way he's gotten to where he is without being an incredibly intelligent person. Um, but I think the same thing. Do you think at the start of their career, or do you think Tom Brady ever said, I'm going to win seven Super Bowls? Mm. He didn't even know if he was going to make the NFL. But then he just kept moving in a direction, kept moving in a direction. I watched a documentary of his on the way the, to Vegas, actually. Uh, or to Texas rather, because we went to Texas first. And um, he was notorious for making players stay back after training. So they'd go to train, they call it practice. They go to practice, they watch film, they they practice, they warm down, and then Tom would be like, let's go. Hmm. He would force them. The coaches wouldn't say anything. The assistant coaches wouldn't say anything. He would be the one forcing them to go out. And they interview this big linebacker with his fucking neck starting out the side of his ears. And he goes, man, Tom was the shittest to play with, but he was also the best because he made you fucking get better. He goes, every every afternoon after practice, we were either watching film or doing extras. 
and you, you see it. You're like, I've been at the highest level of rugby league possible. The people who did the extras, the people who stayed on the field longer than the coaches wanted them to, they were the ones that were really fucking good. <laughs> it's really simple. The guys who study the sport in jujitsu and apply themselves correctly to the learning criteria of the side of the sport, not just the athletic side of the sport, they're really fucking good. The guys who make 4,000 sales calls, they're really fucking good at sales. It's very, very simple. It's easy to look at the guy in the Ferrari and go, oh, fuck, drug dealer. <laughs> you know what? Maybe he is. But I'd rather live in a world where I believe that he earned it one way or another. He's really fucking good at drug dealing. Hey, he even, <laughs> even if he's a fucking drug dealer, he still has to manage clients. He still has to have good product. There's a lot of drug like, dealers that get caught. Exactly right. So even if he is there, he's still fucking earned his way there, right? Yeah. So I think even in that element, you can start to look at people and go, fuck, what, what is this guy like? What does this guy know that I don't? Because let's be honest, if someone's making a million dollars a year, it's not because they're lucky. It's not because they fell into it. It's not because they're fucking coincidentally in the right place at the right time. They built that, whether you like it or not. So instead of saying this guy's a fucking whatever, or this guy is lucky or fortunate, or he has got good genetics for money, mate, I don't know, any of those sorts of realities, why don't you say, what can I learn from this guy? What can I start to break down that he's doing on a better level than I don't? Because he knows something that I don't. Same thing in jiu-jitsu. If someone's a fucking high-level world champion black belt and you're not, whether you like it or not, they know something that you don't. It's very, very simple. And I don't really get how people don't see it that way, but that's how I choose to see it. I choose to see it from that level of understanding where if someone's better than me, it's not because they are better than me. I refuse to believe that. It's because they've learned something or they know something that I don't know. And that means if they learnt it, I can too. Very simple. When you say not better than you, you mean as a whole, as like, when the caps push to the limit because can they be do you, do you think they can be better than you right now because you haven't learned that they're not just better than me okay yeah it's not an absolute term yeah, yeah like you're not like i am taller than you nothing you can do about it yeah but you're not i am not better than you i'm better at you than being tall but that's an inconsequential thing anyway you're better at me than being fucking tan mm. <laughs> you know what i mean like mm. these are sort of inconsequential things but when it comes down to skill development which is how i choose to see the world Skill development means that they went from being shit to suck to bad to average to good to great. Why can't I follow the same path if they've done it? It's like Roger Bannister, the four-minute mile. Have you ever heard of the story? Roger Bannister was the first guy ever to run a four-minute mile. Scientists back in the day believed that you would physically combust if you ran a mile in under four minutes. A week later, 10 more people did yeah. it. What? Was that on a Joe Rogan thing? Maybe. Roger Bannister's a very famous story. Oh, Reece, oh, okay. Very famous I was, I story. I swear, I'd, when you say it now, I've heard it. And yeah. I think it was with Joe Rogan. He actually forgot his shoes on the day. He wasn't even running in athletic shoes. He borrowed someone else's shoes and still did it. Mm. Since then, I think it was in like the 80s or the 90s or the 70s. I don't remember. Since then, thousands of people have done it. Mm. High school it's students. normal now. Now it's normal. So really, if you're listening to this and watching this, you want to make a million dollars, you want to be a fucking black belt, you want to have ultimately success in any endeavor, somebody before you has done it. Mm. Why the fuck does that not mean that you can't do it? Why are you listening to this bullshit inside your head that says, oh, but I don't come from a rich family or don't come from this genetics? Fuck all of that. You know, that's the only reason people don't get what they want. They convince themselves as to why. Literally, that's all it is. In my honest opinion, I'm willing to go out and fucking die on my sword on this. I've seen it so many times now. I've coached hundreds of people. Every single time they don't get what they want is because they convince themselves of it. Not because of circumstance, not because of reality, not because of anything that they were inept at doing or skills that they couldn't learn. It was always because in their own head, they convinced themselves as to why. And like, I've been one of these people. Yeah, I've literally been one of those people. That's why I can tell you from fucking personal responsibility that it, you can not be one of those people eventually. You just have to see it in that light. Mm. Like to see it in third person in a way. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. I think third-person perspective is a very interesting thing, and I ask a lot of questions of my clients about this or my athletes. I would say um, a really good one that you might enjoy is what would somebody that ten, uh, what would somebody do about this that's ten times smarter than me? And you ask yourself that question, and then you have to pretend that you're ten times smarter than you are, which means that you think like somebody who's ten times smarter than you are, which means you probably come up with a better solution to the problem that you're facing, because most people in our lives hit their head against the wall every day doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, expecting different results. It's never going to work. Mm -hmm. The second question I really like is the person that has achieved everything that you have wanted to achieve, what would they have done with their week? And why is what you've done different? 
Because in actuality, if you want to change the person that you are, you want to be more confident, you want to be bigger, stronger, faster, you want to be um, better articulated in how you speak, you want to be a more of a presence when you walk into a room. Like I used to be the shyest kid of all time, all time. And now I'm none of those things because I've learned through this. But how did I get there? I thought about the person I wanted to be and I acted as if I was them. It's like method acting in a movie. You, you see Tom Hardy do it. You see Leonardo DiCaprio do it. You see all these guys do it. And what they start to realize, I studied this a lot. Um, Jim Carrey was actually a huge influence when I started listening to these videos because his motivational videos were, were really, really good. He goes, you start to lose your sense of self and then you realize that it's actually what you tell yourself it is. Because he was playing so many different characters and he starts to think, am I really this much of a goofball in my real life? Or am I this depressed in my real life? Am I this happy in my Some real life? Some the struggle of that where they can't snap yeah, out. Yeah, exactly right. And, and um, a lot of people say that that was what Heath Ledger sort of led into the Joker because he had to That's paint himself as a psychopath. And maybe he turned himself into one. You don't know. But the moral of the story there is that your personality, the way you see yourself, your identity is actually more fluid than you believe it is. And if you look at the etymology of the word identity, it breaks down into the Latin meanings and it actually means continued being. So if your identity is who you are continually being, as in who you are acting as, you can change your fucking identity any day you want. You just have to act in a certain way for a long enough period of time and then eventually you wake up, you're like, holy fuck, I'm this weirdly handsome, successful person and all I had to do was believe that it was true. Yeah. And then it's act so in that direction. Simple. Like when you like write it down, you lay it out, yeah. see it in front of you, it seems so simple. But it is. It is. But it, it is. is. It is. And that's the crazy thing is that people love, humans love complexity. Yeah. They love to think that something is more complex than it seems to argue with themselves as to the reason, like I said, argue for their own limitations for the reason as to which they can't do it. If, I, if that guy did it and I can't do it, it has to mean he knows a secret. It has to mean that he knows something that I don't. It has to mean that there's like this weird complexity that I can't figure out because otherwise I would be doing it. No. Chances are you're lazy, stupid, or arrogant. That's the point. You're too arrogant to believe that you couldn't do something that somebody else has done before you. They've shown you proof of it and you can't do it. I get it all the time. I get questions and, and comments and stuff from all these plebs on social media all the time. And You can't have done that because it takes this long to get it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, but I'm sitting here and I have done it. And I was going to film a really funny video that I have my brown belt and um, a championship belt that they gave me for the Central Coast titles. They do championship belts because no one wants to drive to the Central Coast to do jiu-jitsu. Yeah. So if they have a belt on the line, people are cool. inclined to go. So I won the belt. Uh, and I got my brown belt sitting next to it at my house on like a little shelf in my room and, uh, in the and then like the family room of where the lounges and TV and shit is. And I was going to film a video and be like, so that's not my brown belt behind me? Am I colorblind? Like, is this, is this a different color? Because I fucking own the belt. And it's like, what are you talking about? You haven't earned it. I was like, it's literally sitting here. It's like opening up a briefcase of a million dollars and saying, I'm a millionaire. And they go, no, you're not. Yeah. I was like, I fucking am. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. That's crazy. They, they will always go to different lengths. And generally it come from people People not punching down, they're punching up, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many, oh, yeah. How many black belts can you recall that have told you you're not a brown belt? Not many. If any. I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, may, look, maybe they're pissed off because they didn't achieve the same feat in the same time. Um, like but has there been anyone that you can think of as a black belt who has said something like that to you? Nah. Exactly. Nah. I'm sure there's hundreds of... People punching up. Oh, white belts. Like yeah, yeah, hundreds of white belts, hundreds of blue belts and fucking whinges. But yeah, you're right. Um, I, I often say this in my comment section. When you grow up, you'll realize that no one talks shit from above you. Yeah, no one punches down. No. And it's, it's so true. It really is. Because the reality is if somebody's ahead of you in some area of their life, they have done things that you uh, either haven't done yet or you're not willing to do. So if they're above you in any area, they will also appreciate that you have they have they they will also appreciate the path that they've gone on they've had to eat shit they've had to get better they've had to claw and fucking struggle their way up the chain and they will never doubt anybody who's done the same thing i, I will never see anybody who makes brown belt in jiu-jitsu and go nah, you're a bit of a shit cunt yeah. you know what i mean because i will respect the effort that you put towards that i don't care how long it takes i might not agree with your rank in terms of skill set and I would, I would suggest things to say that you should probably be at this level of skill before 
I don't know, your coach promotes you there. But again, that's not my place to say. But I will never rubbish them as a person. It still took discipline. It still took hard work. It still took effort and intensity over a long period of time that other people weren't willing to do. Because even like jiu-jitsu is a very small world. Even like, And we fight each other a lot about the, the idiosyncrasies and those sorts of things. And whether you like it or not, less than 1% of the earth is a fucking purple belt or above. And we see all of them. We go, oh, this guy this. sucks. This guy sucks. This guy sucks. And it's like, well, you know, compared to the fucking layman, compared to the average person, and people, it, it, it's crazy to me that people jump on Instagram and stuff like that. They say, fuck, Israel Adesanya sucks. Like, I might not like the guy for his personality, but he does not suck. <laughs> like, just because Alex Pereira beats him. Like, Alex Pereira is fucking really good. So is Adesanya. There's only one way you get to the top of your sport and it's by being really good. And people say, oh, you fucking suck. It's like, listen, cunt, you haven't seen your dick over your gut for the last yeah, 20 like years. Commentating. Yeah, exactly right. It's, like, it's just crazy to me that people are like that. But again, to your point, no one punches up. They always punch down. Let's talk about Vegas. So you won the trials here? Yeah, so I won the trials here in uh, June and then Vegas was in September. So it's a growing um, thing now. It's getting bigger. There's more crowds. It's It's... I'm not, is it televised now? It's streaming? Yeah, they streams. Stream. So they're, they're streamed on a partnership deal with a company called Flow Grappling. They're yeah. pretty much like the monopoly in jiu-jitsu. Uh, the second, uh, we actually had like a couple of sponsorship. We, um, Mo Jassim, the head organizer, actually had a couple of, of ADCC, of ADCC had, had a couple of sponsorship things from like um, UFC Fight Pass mm. and ESPN. Is um is Joe Rogan sponsor of his podcast? Joe Rogan does. Yeah, Joe Rogan yeah. does sponsor it. He actually sponsors the best athlete in jiu-jitsu in the world too, Gordon, Gordon Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. yeah, so it's really cool. Like Joe's getting behind it. Um, he's one of the primary reasons that I actually started because he was the one that was talking about it the most. And I was like, what is this jiu-jitsu shit? He I was, it. bro, I was one of those guys who when the fight goes to the ground in the UFC, boo, stand really? him up. And now I'm a fucking expert in that version of the sport. I've always loved it. I don't know why. I think my dad used to kind of like it. He used to watch early days UFC. Yeah. See? And I was yeah. a big UFC fan, but Rashad Evans and oh, yeah. that time Rampage, Ultimate Fighter, breaking the door down. Yeah, like, that's that, funny. That was when it was like, oh, what yeah. the fuck? And my that's dad and brother used to- The golden era. Yeah. And the golden era. I don't know why. I always kind of respected the jiu-jitsu side, jiu -jitsu side and the technique and- how tactical it was and so dangerous as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think every single element of MMA is super technical and it depends on what your specific training background is to see how good people are. Like we're, we're lucky enough to have Tyson Pedro at our gym. Um, I'm his main training so what's partner. The, is that HPU gym? Uh, no, that's for Sydney West Martial Arts in Penrith. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, it's not my gym, but it's where I train. Yep. Um, and you, you see him in the jiu-jitsu and he's very good and he's like a specialist in that area as well. But when he strikes with people, like all the boys at sparring, they say, man, it's just another world because he freezes you. There's so many little idiosyncrasies and crazy tiny little technique things that he's throwing at you piece by piece that you're like, is that going to be a jab? Is that going to be, oh, too late. I got punched in the face. People don't understand that. They That's have no idea. No disrespect for Tyson Pedro. He's amazing. But, and then we go back to Adesanya and then yeah. hating on Adesanya and Alex Pereira. Yeah. At that level, man, every little movement. You have like, no idea. Can kill, like one wrong decision. You get yeah. knocked out, you get killed. Exactly. It's the same in jiu-jitsu. You put your leg in the wrong place for one, one tiny little second, it's you get heel hooked. Out. Your knee is blown apart. I've seen that video of that really big guy where he just fucking rips that cunt's knee. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, that's, that's scary. I trained with him. Really? In Texas. Yeah, his name is Big Dan. Uh, I'm pretty sure if that's a video you're talking about, he does rip he people's got knees. got long hair. Oh, like maybe it wasn't. Hair. Maybe he it wasn't. He kind of looks fat. You have to show me. Uh, I saw it on TikTok. I yeah, think. you have to show me. It's like he went from in two seconds, he got the thing and just rip, like. Oh, that, that, that might have been Paul Harris. Well, Hara is, is the only guy to ever get banned from the UFC for holding on to submission. Really? Yeah. Ruzumir Pohare is a Brazilian guy, and um, he had a match against Gary Tonin. Ruzumir Pohare is fucking jacked. He looks like an IFBB bodybuilder. And um, Gary Tonin competes in the 77 kilo weight class. And Gary just went up against him and just went, fuck it. Let's see what happens. I don't remember who won. I think it was like a decision victory. I think Gary ended up winning. That was crazy, yeah, because he's fucking super dangerous, very good, and will just hold on to shit very unnecessarily. Uh, and and it's just one of those things. Two seconds, if you just extend it a little bit more, you're good. Yeah, and super frowned upon in jiu-jitsu. Like, yeah. I, I'm pretty nice, even in competition. Like, I won't smash things on. Like, I'll, I'll get them, they'll realize they're fucked, and then they'll tap. Yeah, they realize checkmate. Yeah, unless it's a rear naked choke, because if I punch that across your face, that's your problem. Yeah. 
Like there's just, you know, I'm not going to fucking just sit there and go, oh, I'm going to nicely put my arm under your chin and then put you to sleep. Like, no, it's just going across your face. Oh, you mean when you're getting it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Enough, yeah. yeah. And some people might like that, not like that. But, you know, if you were in the same position, you'd do it to me. So all there's certain all positions fair. where like you can kind of hold like say a knee thing where you're like, all right, bro, you're done. Yeah. And most guys will tap. But, this, but it depends. Like, really? It depends because some of these crazy fuckers don't tap. Like I've seen that video of the, the guy I'm talking about, this one video, it was just crazy and there's heaps of comment threads about it and I was yeah. reading it where it's like he got it and just went bang. It's like the guy didn't even have a chance to tap. Yeah, sometimes it happens. <laughs> but we, we practice this thing at our gym and if you're watching this and you do jujitsu, you should do verbal taps. So when someone gets a heel hook on you and you're facing the wrong way, they might not necessarily feel you tapping their leg or you might miss their leg or it's very fucking high paced and fast. Yeah. Um, so you should just say tap. It's much easier because then there's no there's no disrespect involved. It's like, oh, I felt I felt a tap or I didn't feel a tap. No, he said it, just let go straight away. But yeah, the Vegas comp, so you get flown out there? Yeah, so they, they, compete? they pay for us. Um, they pay for us to go. They give us seven days of accommodation, which is really, really cool. It's actually wow. the precedent in jiu-jitsu, the premier competition in jiu-jitsu for that reason. Um, if you compete in the IBJJF, you don't get paid. You have to pay your way there. You have to find your way there. You have to pay to compete. It's tough. fucking ridiculous it's it's tough. crazy because some of these guys are in brazil they live in favelas they don't have 1400 us dollars to get fucking flights and accommodation and all that sort of stuff and i was lucky enough to get a lot of really good sponsors um so i got sponsored to go over there by a bunch of people um, my coach came with me we went to texas for just under two weeks first to train with the best team in the world where gordon ryan trains called new wave um did some training there it was really good good experience we went to vegas uh, about five days out from the competition um vegas sucks don't go there for any more than 48 hours. Like it's really good. The spectacle is really cool. And then you get over it immediately. It's like adult Disney world. There's just like the people can smoke indoors. Fucking cunts are lazy. They stand in the way. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare. It's like going to Ikea. You don't just don't, you just don't want to be there. Your yeah. missus wants to drag you there. You're like, oh, it's going to be fun. We can look at towels. It's like, no, I'm, I'm done with this in 20 minutes. It's yeah. the same thing as Vegas. I mean, I don't drink and I don't gamble. So maybe... That's the reason yeah, I didn't yeah. like it. Maybe yeah. that's a majority reason, but I don't really You're like there for Vegas. One reason. I was there for one reason, yeah. So um, we get uh, told who we're fighting on the Friday, and then we fight on the Saturday. And I ended up coming up against Felipe Pena. And Felipe Pena is widely considered as one of the top five guys to ever do it in Nogi. He's a. You made it to the final, didn't you? Uh, he was a bronze medalist in the 99 kilo division this year. So how does it work? It was a does divisions. You're in what division? So there's 16 people per 16 people per division. There's five weight divisions in the men's. So there's 66, 77, 88, 99, 99 plus. I'm in the 99 plus division. Um, and it's a bracket seating system. So the way that it works is pretty much how it used to work in the NRL, like first versus eight, second versus seventh, but it's 16. So the number one in the world or the number one seed will verse the worst person. Oh, that's tough. It's pretty rough. What um, you? I was 14th. So you're versing third. So I versed second. third. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which was Felipe Pena. Um, that's tough. Yeah. Felipe has been a black belt five times longer than I've been training. And it's what? It's knockout? Yeah. Single elimination. Yeah, so 16 will go to 8, 8 will go to 4, 2 will go to 1. Fuck. Yeah. Hardcore. Yeah, it's fucking cool. So it's, a, it's a very cool format. He, he knocked you out in that round? Yeah, so I got beaten by points. Uh, he ended up scoring 8 points on me. Didn't get submitted. How does um, points work? So points in ADCC is um, it's very artic it's, it's very systematic. So for the first half of the match, they're 10-minute matches. First half of the match, there's no points. The first five minutes. First five minutes, no points. So you can you can take risks. You can go for submissions. Just don't get subbed. Just don't get subbed. Basically, a lot of people unfortunately take this upon themselves to take stalling as as a part of their game. So they just wait for the five minutes, then they score points, and then they fuck off for the rest of the round. It's really annoying. You get in trouble um, for that, but yeah, you get stalling penalties. But there's a way to gamify the rules where that doesn't really yeah. it doesn't really impact you too much. You can go the whole way through and not submit anybody and still win the tournament. And uh, Yuri Samoz is a perfect example of that. Didn't even attempt a submission. It's pretty gay. It's fucking gay. Yeah. <laughs> it's very gay. He yeah. didn't even attempt a submission the whole weekend. He came, I believe he came second or third in his weight class and he came first in the absolute division. And he didn't yeah. attempt to sub the whole weekend. It was That's fucking good. terrible. But anyway. Second um, half of five minutes. Yeah, people want to play. People want to play how they want to play. Um, second half points are on in the five minutes. So you get two points for a takedown. 
You get four points for a clean takedown. So usually a takedown will result in somebody being put in some sort of guard, like half guard or full guard or something like that. Um, If you score a takedown to the outside of their guard, it's four points. That's the the highest that you can score in ADCC. Uh, Also a clean sweep. Clean sweep is a four points as well. Um, A sweep is two points. Mount is... That's sweeps where you you clear their legs and... Yeah, well, you, you go from top to bottom. Okay. Yeah, so if you're chest to chest and you go from top to bottom, that's a sweep. But if you go a sweep past the guard, that's four points. Um, that's the most lucrative way to score in ADCC. Uh, the back is three points. Mount is also taking three, their back. three points. Yeah, taking their back. So both hooks have to be in. Uh, or you can use a body triangle, which is where the shin comes across the belly and the, el- the leg goes over the top. Um, so they're both three points. Neon belly is two points. Neon belly is pretty fucking self-explanatory. Uh, any guard pass is two points. Uh and that's it. You don't get points for submission attempts or anything like that. Oh, Obviously, really? you, if you submit somebody, the match is over. It doesn't count towards any points. So I went the full 10 minutes. How many points did he get? I uh, got eight points. What did you get? So I ended up getting reversed. I was in a submission attempt. So if you get reversed and you're in a submission attempt, so let's say I get put on my back, um, but the reason I went onto my back was I was going for an armbar. If I hold that for more than three seconds and the position has changed, I won't get scored on. So as long as I hold, oh sorry, so as long as I hold on to the submission, I won't get scored on. But as soon as I let go of the submission, I have three seconds to get off my ass. Otherwise, I, I submit and mm-hmm. I concede bottom position. Kind of like when did you watch Chandler and Poirier. Yes, Chandler went for something and then Dustin took his back. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, and exactly ended right. Ended up submitting him, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's more of an opportunistic one. That would be more of like a mistake on Chandler's behalf. Yeah. Um, but let's say if I go, if I get double legged or rugby league tackled and I go for a guillotine like a headlock as soon as I get taken down uh, it's only until his head clears my grip that I will be able to be scored on so it doesn't matter if I'm down on the ground for 10 seconds if I'm still holding on to his head I then have three seconds as soon as he lets go so ADCC rule set is the premier rule set by far it promotes the most amount of movement it promotes the most exciting com- uh, combat that you can have it's, it's like the UFC of, gra- of it's easily the best rule set. Yeah. Easily. And yeah. it promotes a lot of exciting matches. Sometimes people gamify the rules and they stall and stuff like that, but that's more indicative of the people rather than the rule set. You have that in everything, man. You have that in um, soccer when they just play, you know, park the park the bus, they call it. Or yeah. in union when they just take field goals or in exactly. fucking, even in MMA when they just leg kick and run, like they say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's far sub- it's far superior to the IBJJF because IBJJF is literally that a Grand Prix tournament, like an absolute tournament. Absolute means all weight classes. The guy who won the tournament got three sweeps. That was it. They were like six or eight minute matches or whatever they were. I didn't even watch it. Like it's fucking terrible. Mind you, it was in the gi. It's fucking boring as shit. But they literally grab grips, sweep somebody, get two points, and then stay on top of them. Not lose. That's the whole match. Yeah, yeah they fight not to lose rather than fight to win. Whereas in ADCC, you see flying crazy submissions. You see people going out there and getting after it. Like um, Cade Rotolo is now the youngest ever ADCC champion. He won the 77 kilo division, which is also touted as the hardest division to win because they're just freaks. Like the 66 kilo guys aren't really that strong, but they're fast. The 77 kilo guys are strong perfect and mix. fast. They're the perfect mix. 88 kilo guys are stronger than they are fast. And then so on and so forth for the 99 and the 99 plus. The 99 plus are probably too strong and too slow for the majority. Um, but yeah, the 77 kilo is that right mix. It's the average statistics of how much men weigh in the world. I think I believe the average male is five foot eight and weighs 74 kilos. So they have the highest population density, which means they have the highest level of competition, which means they have the best skilled athletes. It's pretty, um, that weight class is pretty notorious in a lot of, like in UFC. Lightweight. Lightweight. Stacked. Because that's where the most, that's where the most people live. Yeah. That's just the majority of numbers. can relate to it a little bit more. Yep. They could feel like, oh, that that could be me. Yeah. But think about it like this, right? How many people do you know that are 120 kilos and under 10% body fat? None. I like I don't know any just me. Now. Yeah, ju- ju- just <laughs> me. And yeah. like, I don't know anybody else either. The guys in my weight class, um, I think, like. Let's see, that's why that lightweight is so relatable and famous. And then the heavyweight is such a spectacle. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, the, the giants, the yeah. orcs, the yeah. fucking ogres. Yeah. Um, but if you look up the majority of people who weigh 120 kilos plus, they're all fucking type three diabetic. Yeah. They've got type one and type two. <laughs> they're all fucking fat messes. And that's like Gordon Ryan, the champ of that comp. Yeah. So exactly. What's the prize? Is there prize money? Yeah, I think there's a uh, hundred grand if you win the super fight. 
I think there's a hundred grand if you win the absolute, and I think it's twenty or something if you win each division. I'm not too sure. What's the absolute? The absolute is the open the open weight. So you can put your hand in at the end of day one. There's two day event. So at the end of day one, you can put your hat in the ring to say, "All right, I want to do the absolute against anyone against anybody." You could be sixty six kilos. You could be ninety nine plus. You said the seventy seven kilo guy won. Ah, uh, no. So the seventy seven kilo guy was the guy who won the division. The oh. guy who won the absolute division was in the ninety nine unders weight Lord class. Ryan didn't do it. Uh, no, he's not allowed to do it because otherwise he would fight himself. So the way the ADCC works is if you win the absolute championship, you then get a super fight in the next ADCC. You versus the previous absolute champion. Oh, so okay. Gordon Ryan won in 2019. I think. Oh. Yeah, he won the absolute division in 2019 against Bushesha. Um, and then Yuri Samoz won in 2022. So he Gordon wins. will verse Yuri Samoz oh. in 2024. This, for anyone that doesn't know, this guy is like, what, undefeated for how long? Oh, bro, Gordon Ryan is 60 matches undefeated. Hasn't been beaten since 2017. 80% submission so 60. rate. Uh, yeah, 60 fights in a row. I thought it was like 300. Oh, what no, no, no. See? Yeah, no. No. See? Oh, he might have had already that many levels of comp- – well, that many events of competition, but right now at Black Belt, um, he's won every single major title. He's won Nogi Pans. He's won Nogi Worlds. Uh, he's won ADCC. He's the premier winner of medals bar Andre Galvao for ADCC in all time. He's been to three ADCCs and he has five medals. Completely fucking unprecedented. Um, the only person who has more medals than him is Andre Galvao, who he submitted in the super fight this year. Like nobody's been able to touch Andre Galvao for the last six. I think he has five super fight medals or four super fight medals. So he's basically been undefeated for over eight years in super fights in ADCC. Gordon goes out and subs him in 11 minutes. It's fucking disgusting. Like, it's actually crazy. Crazy. And just complete and utter dominance the entire the entire time. The only person who he didn't submit in the weight division was Victor Hugo. And I believe it was... He left it a little bit too late to try and submit him because he wanted to show off his passing skills. So what Gordon does that is really fucking bullshit is that if somebody has a natural attribute or a natural... Um, Bullshit as in crazy Like fuck crazy. this guy is too good They have a natural proclivity for something So Victor Hugo is very bendy He plays guard very well Gordon goes Well I'm going to pass him as many times as I can in the fucking match And I'm just going to do it Gordon is famous for calling the submission that he's yeah. going to hit In an envelope before the fucking match starts And then hitting it in the match It's cra- It's disgusting because he's doing it to world champion black belts He's not doing it to scrubs off the street He's doing it to guys who dedicate their entire fucking life to the sport and there's nothing you can do about it. It's crazy. But again, to go back to what I was saying previously. He trains every day. He has learned something that I have not, which means he can, it can be learnt, which means that I can be next. That's how I see it. I don't I see... Like yeah, oh, bro, I get it all the time. So I posted this thing on TikTok next to John Danaher because we went and trained with him, me and my coach. And they were like, oh, bro, used a, go- uh, used a photo of Gordon. I was like, that's me, you fuckwit. I was like, what are you talking about? And then they looked at it again. I was like, oh, sorry, bro. Like, you just look like Gordon. I was like, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. It was actually really funny. When I was in the showers at Roca, at the professional um, training sessions in Texas, Gordon walked in and Gordon's like, world number one, he's a bit of a big deal. So when it comes time to shower time, there's only one shower. You, you let him go first because he's got other shit to do. So, oh, whatever. He walks in, I have my shirt off in the change room and he goes, fuck. I was like, what? He goes, I wish I was a real heavyweight because he struggles to put heaps of weight on and he, he's only ever like 103 kilos, but he's oh. in the plus 99 division and I'm walking around at like 121, 119, anything like that. And he was like, I was like, fuck, that's such a moral victory. That's the yeah. best. I was like, eventually when I get my skill set, I'd love to fucking take a crack at it. Um, it's unfortunate because like he's fucking 20 years ahead of everybody technically, but I, I really truly believe that my coach – um, Luke in Australia he learns a lot from John and stuff like that I really think that he's doing the right things to push us towards that level of progression and we're starting to see it already like our gym won the the team trophy at trials um, we came first and second in the 66 kilo division so one of our teammates had to beat the other teammate to win and then I came first in the 99 kilo division and we beat everybody Everybody. So we're taking team team trophy home at the biggest comp in the Australian Oceanic region, and then we're taking home team trophies at every local comp as well. Like it's it's getting superior. In, it's in getting ri- it's getting ridiculous now. Yeah. Like even is um, there a point where you got to move because it's it's like big fish little pond? I don't think so. I think there's more than enough competition here, um, and I think it's the way that you train. I think the way that you train is much more important. Like I'm in the big I'm in the best room in Australia by far, 
Um, and I think if you can't develop in the best room in your country, then that's more to say about you than it is to say about the training. Um, for a long time, the general conception of the idea was that you had to move to the States to get really, really good. And to some level, I still agree that there's a lot of high level training partners there that would definitely benefit, but I don't think you have to, I don't think it's necessary anymore. Like you got to put it into perspective. The guys at like, let's say new wave or B team, they're all professional athletes. They all train jiu-jitsu full-time. They work for jiu-jitsu full-time. They earn money off jiu-jitsu full-time. They're thinking about it all day, every day. They don't do anything else. The majority of guys I train with are school teachers, mm. tradies, plumbers. Um, Could be a hobby or... Yeah. They're, oh. as, they're as professional as they can be, but they still don't train twice a day, every single day. They don't earn money through jiu-jitsu. They don't train every single day. Like they, they have days off, stuff like that. There's three or four of us who train every single day. Um, there's three or four of us who earn money through jiu-jitsu predominantly. Um, I obviously do online coaching as well as earning money through jiu-jitsu. Um, but there's only three or four of us and I'm the only one within 50 kilos of the rest. So it's like, yeah, I've got these guys to train with, but they're 60 kilo, 70 kilo guys. How much How much really can they push me? Um, the answer is not very much. But in the same point, again, going back to the general statistics of the population with 77 kilo people being the main majority of people, there's not very many people who are 120 kilos that move like me anyway. So even if I was to go to the States, I might have the same problems just at a higher level. So that's the way I see it. And is it worth moving across? I've been to America. I've been to America once. I lived there for a month. I loved Texas. Austin was fantastic. I don't think I'd move there. Really? I don't think I would. I came back to Australia and I went, thank fuck. Thank fuck I live in Australia. Like if you guys haven't been to an international holiday for a long period of time, like a month, man, we have it so good here. It's fucking crazy. It's, it's ridiculous. And it depends on where you live, obviously. If you live in fucking Macquarie Fields, you might say something different. Um, but man, Australia is where it's at. Yeah. We have, we, we have everything. It's crazy. But even, even something small down to the level of availability of cultured food. Like we're in Homebush right now. I guarantee there's a fucking uh, shisha kebab place like five minutes down the road. And then there's gun Thai, really good Indian. Chinese, heaps of Indian food. There's, yeah. there's stuff to be had everywhere. In America, especially in like Texas, there was like barbecue. American barbecue and Mexican food. Really? Yeah. Really, really good. But you wouldn't be able to find Chinese. You wouldn't be able to find Thai food. You'd, you'd find like burgers and stuff like that, all the generic American food and all that bits and pieces. But you wouldn't be able to find world-class Malaysian food, yeah. world-class Thai food. Like if you drive 20 minutes down to Cabramatta, you get world-class food, Vietnamese. It's like unbelievable food. You drive another 20 minutes to Newtown, you get unbelievable um, uh, Malaysian food. There's just so many different cultures that we're like a hot spot and everybody goes, oh, oh, Australians don't have any culture or stuff like that. We have everything. We have everything. Mm -hmm. it, like it, it's honestly, it's astonishing. Yeah. And that, that affects not just food, like mindset, way of living. Yeah. Cultural difference, everything. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about one more thing before I let you go. There's So with ADCC and BJJ competitions, mm -hmm. you're allowed to take uh, substances, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It's open to everything. Yeah, oh, it depends on the competition. So the IBJJF tests you, but it's a fucking intelligence test. You can't pass their piss test. That's pretty fucking stupid. They only they only test every other black belt who wins a gold medal. So really all the way up in the brown belt, you can be enhanced. And then as soon as you hit black belt, it's like every other black belt. So you basically have to get unlucky or it has to be a fucking intelligence test. You could come off a couple of weeks before and piss clean. It'd be fine. How come you're allowed to? Uh, because in ADCC, the premier competition... They don't encourage it, but they don't say anything about it. It's, it's not like it's not a, a internationally recognized sport that's under WADA or SADA or anything like that. You're pretty much allowed to do whatever you want. Just like Pride back in the day where they literally had it in the contracts, take as much shit as you want. We want to see freaks and champions and all this crazy shit. Same thing as the WWE. Not that WWE is a sport, but it's, it's still a sport. They go take through their bodies and everything. It's not like a, a recognized sport with the national body and stuff like that. Mm. So it's a good question as to why it, is allowed um but at the same time just play the game of the rules play the rules of the game you're in and a lot of people whinge and bitch they're like oh how do you feel fucking taking testosterone and you're against local guys that are natty at comps and it's like well if you're allowed to that's your problem i not have the advantage if you if you're an elite athlete you will do what it takes not what you think it takes i'm willing to forego social situations i'm willing to forego playing on my phone until 11 p.m I'm willing to forgo a lot of these things. I'm willing to forgo eating KFC during the week. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to do a lot more than most people aren't. I'm willing to create a fucking business 
that earns me enough money so that I can train all day, every day, do 13 sessions a week. Do you think that person's also not going to take the advantage and fucking take an edge as well? Like they did a study and I don't remember when it was. And I don't remember what publication it was. Sorry, I don't remember the fucking PMID <laughs> number. We don't have Jamie here. Yeah, we don't have Jamie here. We can't look it up. But they tested, they did a survey of Olympic level athletes. The best you can get, the best of the best. If you were to take a pill that would guarantee you a gold medal, but you would die in five years, would you take it? If I could take a pill that would guarantee me a gold medal, but I would die in five, I wouldn't. 80% said yes. Really? 80%. Die in five years? They are elite level athletes. This is what they live, breathe, shit, oh, and this, sleep sorry, for. This in, uh, survey was only Olympic level athletes. Okay, 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 and okay. it gives you the idea that elite level athletes are fucking built differently the way that they think about things. They're willing to eat chicken, broccoli, and rice for extended periods of time and have no flavor in their food to look a certain way in bodybuilding. It goes back to that story of dunking the head in the water. Exactly. Yeah. They want it more than you do. So that's the thing. If you're wanting to be elite, you're going to do what it takes, not what you fucking think it takes, not what you feel like it takes. And this, this is an even bigger meta point. The majority reason that most people don't get what they want is because they do what they feel like, not what the fucking needs it, not what it needs, right? So people wake up in the morning and they go, I don't feel motivated today, I'm not going to the gym. I feel sad today, I'm not going to the gym. I feel tired today, I'm not going to the gym. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. If you said you actually wanted it, you have to be ready to fucking do it. That's just, that's the easiest way to put it. If you only do things when you feel like doing them, you might only feel like do it. Like, I don't remember the last time I felt motivated to go to jiu-jitsu. I don't remember. Actually, I lie. I remember the last time I was motivated to go to jiu-jitsu because I fucking got beat in a, in, a, um, in a decision and it pissed me the fuck off. And that was when I was motivated to go to jiu-jitsu. That was like four weeks ago and that's already subsided. All the other times it's just, I'm going to jiu-jitsu. I'm already, I haven't even decided that I'm going. It's just part of my day. Mm. I don't decide that I want to eat good food. It's just part of my day. I don't decide that I want nine hours of sleep. It's just part of my day. I don't care how I feel. I don't care if I feel happy, sad, motivated, unmotivated, distraught, distressed. Uh, I don't care. I, it, the work is getting done. It's irrelevant because in my mind and my opinion, you will lap everybody else that cares about their feelings. And I'm not saying that feelings aren't important. Feelings are very important. You should feel your feelings and then you should do your fucking work any way that you are prepared to do. Because there's people out there that are going to do more than you on a day-to-day -day basis and you're going to be worried about how you're feeling. That'll make you feel better. Exactly. And it's the same thing in competition, right? People go, oh, how do you avoid feeling tired in competition? I say, it doesn't even come into my realm of understanding. It doesn't even come into my, my thought process at all. I know I'm going to be tired in competition. It's fucking competition. But am I going to let that, am I ever going to let that dictate my actions? No. And I, like I've been guilty of the past in rugby league. I'd always gas myself out and think, oh, fuck, I'm so tired, blah, blah, blah. And it starts to take over your mental perception of, of what actually is happening so much so that you pull yourself out of the game. You can't be present. Oh, I'm so, not going to take a run this set because I want to D up next set. Exactly. Because yeah. I'm going to think about the fucking energy that I need to conserve. And then you conserve so much energy, 80 minutes goes past, you did nothing. Mm. Congratulations, fuckhead. You yeah. played yourself. Yeah. I used to do it. I used to do it all the time. I would convince myself that I was too tired to do the work that was expected of me that I did at training five days a week, which is ridiculous because I was doing it in terms of a time perspective. I was doing it for more than seven hours during the week. What's 80 minutes? Yeah. 80 minutes is much less than seven hours. It's crazy. I, lo I look back on thinking of it and I, like I said, I think you're meant to be exactly where you're meant to be. And I think punishing yourself for not being where you are is the worst form of mental prison because people go, oh, I should be a fucking millionaire. I put in this much effort. Chances are, if you put in that much effort, you would be. If you really put in that much effort of what was necessary, not what you thought it took, you would be. Andrew today even said that. He said, have you ever seen someone who like, did not stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. And didn't make it to where they wanted to. Fully committed themselves, did everything they needed to, showed up on time, Constantly. fucking dedicated themselves, became obsessed with fucking success. They did it every day, day in, day out. Didn't care about how they felt. Didn't care about what the fucking weather was doing. And they did it for a long enough period of time. They're always fucking successful. Mm. Always. And, and people would start to measure themselves around success and failure as like these two deterministic terms. It's not true. It is a time frame rather than a determinism. Like I have failed, good, move on. I have succeeded, good, move on. I don't celebrate my successes very much. I don't fucking wallow in my fails. There's going to be millions more and I hope there is. I hope there's millions more fails than I get successes because they teach you the most. But they're going to be a part of my life whether I like it or not. 
So if they're going to be a part of my life and I don't care about how I feel, I don't care about how I feel in relationship to those things, cool. Let's tick as many boxes as we can along the way. Let's get as many tallies on the board for successes and failures, fa- failures and see how many I can stack up. Because the person who fails the most learns the most. You yeah. learn that through jujitsu. The wins are going to be more sweet. Yeah, but even then it's yeah. like, am I doing it to feel the sweetness of the win or am I doing it because I've committed myself to become this person through daily action? I think that's the thing that I enjoy a lot more around the way that I think is that I'm not waiting for this big payday. I'm not waiting for this huge opportunity because if you wait for an opportunity it's going to pass you and someone else is going to pick it up and they're the ones that have been working to it every single day without stopping it's just a fact of the matter it's, it's a competition it's survival instincts that's all it is do you have like an end goal or a like light at the end of the tunnel not that you're in a tunnel but mm. that like i like how you phrase that i'm like i'm not in the tunnel yeah. so there is no light at the end of the tunnel i think the world is your oyster as much as you say that it is and i don't believe in putting self-perceived limitations on anything i don't know where it's going to take me but i'm fucking excited about it Mm. because progress and excellence will take me as far as i will deserve to go i don't know what that looks like i have an idea of what i want in my life like i want to drive a nice car i want to have a really fucking dope house i want to do the best that i could possibly have ever done in sport that i choose to do I want to do the same thing for business. I want to do the same thing for relationships. Uh, Like, I don't know if I want kids or anything yet, but I know I'm going to be a fucking phenomenal father. I'm going to play the exact same role that I do in my businesses and in my sport that I do in raising kids. Um, I really think that if people can start to grasp this concept of, I want to make a hundred grand a year. Well, based on what we've just talked about, you're already putting a perceived ceiling on top of yourself. What if you started to think about ideas that would make you a hundred million dollars a year? you would have to expand your realm of capability and your realm of possibility to force you to think about better ideas. Alex Hormozzi has this really good saying. They go, how would you make 100 grand? Or or, what would be the best way to make $100,000? And he goes, find something for 100 grand, sell it, and do whatever the the fuck you want with the rest of your year. And people don't think like that. People go, oh, well, I'd have to get two grand a week, which means I'd have to sell this many or work this many hours. I have to do 40 hours a week at $50, hour, $50 a thing and then plus tax and all that sort of stuff. Your, your model of thinking is broken because you're using a goal that is broken. If I said to myself I wanted to be a black belt, as soon as I get there, I will stop doing the things that got me there. I will stop doing the necessary things that got me to that stage and I'll end up being a really shitty black belt. But if my goal is progress and excellence like it has been the entire time in my jiu-jitsu career, I have gotten so far because of those two things. I didn't say I wanted my brown belt in less than two years because that would have been deemed unrealistic. I didn't say that I wanted it in one year because that would have been deemed unrealistic and it's probably not achievable anyway. But you're putting, whether, whether too low or too high, you're putting a self-limitation on yourself. And I use this example in weight loss as well. It's, if you ask better questions, you get better answers. So if I ask myself a level one question for weight loss is like, Uh, I want to lose weight. The reason why it's a level one question is because it's not a question, it's a fucking statement. If you said to me you wanted to lose weight, what about I say, how about I cut your foot off? Is that weight loss? Mm -hmm. It fulfills the goal, right? It fulfills weight loss, but it's not what you want. So a level two question is, how do I lose fat tissue? You eat at a calorie deficit and you exercise more. You have to burn energy from somewhere. You have to either burn energy from an exercise deficit or from an energy deficit or for a caloric deficit. Level three question. Because eventually, as soon as you lose the weight, you lose a kilo, you stop doing the things necessary. You cut the fucking diet, you start eating chips and bagels and fucking Oreos and shit again. Then you go, ah, it's too hard. Level three question is, how do I lose weight continuously and learn how to keep it off? That's a level three question. So now you're learning that you go, all right, not only do I want to lose weight, I want to be the person that loses weight and then maintains it. A level four question, and I think this is the highest order of the questions, is how do I make sure that I commit to daily actions every single day so that I look the best I could look every single year for the rest of my life? Think about the methods of those. If I cut my leg off, I lose weight. That's a pretty shit method. You don't want to fucking lose your weight. If I lose fat and I don't learn how to keep it off, I'm in that yo-yo phase of losing 10 kilos, putting 10 kilos back on, losing 10 kilos, putting 10 kilos back on. If I, learn, if I learn to lose weight and then keep it off, I might become skinny fat. I might not have an aesthetic physique. I will be less fat. I will keep the fat off, but I won't look fucking phenomenal. Versus my level four question. I will have to learn the knowledge, the wisdom, the skills, the experience to not only gain weight in muscle, but lose weight in fat. 
I will also have to develop a specific routine that's focused on sustainability and effort over a long period of time so that it will be unreasonable for me to not be successful over any given period of time. If you can think like that for all your goals and all your achievements, like even for this, how do I make a good podcast? Will you fucking do episode one? Yeah. That's how you make a good podcast. How do I do the best podcast that I could do? Well, I commit to a series of events of daily actions of making sure that I hit enough people up to get a fucking person a week. I make sure that I get as many episodes out as I possibly can to get viewership time and they start to relate to you a little bit better. I talk to interesting people and I hold good conversations. I work on my personal skills to be able to articulate myself and give free-flowing information like you have done. Like I've fucking rambled on this. But you've asked good questions that led into other things and led into other things and that, that starts to open up the chain of communication. And then I do it in a high-quality way where people aren't pissed off when they listen to it. So there's no microphone or like muffling. There's no squeak in the background. It's a good quality product and people want to engage in it. Then I build a brand around it because people want to associate themselves with brands. Whether you like it or not, people don't buy Ferraris because they're expensive. They don't buy Ferraris because they're reliable. They break down all the time. They buy Ferraris because they fucking deliver status. Somebody will see you in it and go, fuck. Same thing with watches. Exact same thing with Rolex. Is a Rolex better at telling the time than a G-Shock? No. Is someone going to give a fuck if you wear a G-Shock? No. Is someone going to give a fuck if you wear a Rolly? Yeah. Probably. That's why you bought it. Yeah. Not because it's expensive, not because it's handcrafted. Like those um, Jacob & Co watches look like dog shit. Yeah. They're so expensive. They take six months to make and they look like shit. Do they tell time better than any other watch? No, but it's a status thing. I blew 500 grand on a watch that you don't have. If like, you walk into a meeting with people and you're wearing a Jacob & Co, they know, okay, this guy's serious. Yeah, this guy's got fat nuts. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they're trying to say. Yeah. Um, but I think I think that's a fucking good way to look at it. Um, I, I think it's a good way to sort of perceive where you're moving through and asking better questions will always get better results. And if you're listening to this, and you're like, how does this apply to my life? Go through the four stages. What would I need to do to make it unreasonable that I don't achieve my goal? Yeah, if you can answer, not to reach it. if you can answer that question, it doesn't matter about how long it takes. I really want to drive this point home because everybody goes, "I'm going to be a millionaire by 25. I'm going to run a successful business in 90 days." No, I had a guy ask me the other week, and he wants to do a jujitsu thing that I'm currently doing. So I, I told him the wrong information because my products way better. I didn't. He said to me, "He goes, how did you build such an impressive online brand? Online." persona or like a community and I thought about it and I thought really pissed off about that question because he's trying to get me to give him the secrets to everything and the, the secret is there is no secret I said to him post every fucking day for four years straight on social media interact with hundreds of people thousands of people every fucking year for four years straight never have a day off you know what I liked about your online persona mm. when I followed you you messaged me. Yeah. You sent me that, um, what did you say? If you, It's a big message. Like, like I really appreciate it. the follow. Yeah. I really appreciate the support. If you have any questions about coaching or jiu-jitsu yeah. or anything like that, if you ever need a question answered, please feel free to ask me. And you reply. It's not yeah. just a bullshit automated thing. Yeah, you know. no. I, like, I copy and paste the message and I send it to everybody, but I actually am genuinely interested. If somebody wants to fucking take the time out of their day to look at my page, enjoy it enough to click follow to say they want more, I deserve to be that person to say, you know what? Maybe they want something else and maybe they have a question they couldn't answer from somebody else. Maybe they want an expert in their corner. There's a reason they followed me. Exactly. There has to be a reason. I don't follow anybody I don't want to follow. So the reason is, it's like they, they want something. If I can be the person to drop a nugget of wisdom like I have on this podcast or like say something in a different way that they didn't think about or show them a way to do things that they never thought about or expand their horizon for what they think is possible in their life, I'm going to fucking do it. I really am. I said it on the end of my podcast yesterday, I filmed my one, um, and I said, my m chief operation with everything that I do is to fucking force people to get better. I really believe it. I, I believe that th the world is such a fucking grim and boring place if you let it be. But it's also so fucking exciting if you allow it. And I think not enough people get to that stage in their life. A lot of people fucking reside themselves to going to uni, getting a job, working 40 hours a week, and dying. A lot of people reside themselves to that. It fucking hurts me to see. Sad. Honestly, it is sad. It's really fucking depressing. It's, it's easy to get trapped in it, honestly. Like, it really is. I'm kind of in the stage, transition stage right now, but I went to uni. Yeah. That's all I was told to do. I've got a 40-hour-a-week job for a company that 
It's not mine. Yeah, there's no personal gain in it for you apart from a paycheck. Kind of just a number in the thing. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of the same routine all the time. Yep. But I got to look for other things to, you know, try and escape that. Yeah. And I, I think it's like, it comes down to what you want, right? Because there, there are people that genuinely do want that. They want the white picket fence. They want the wife, the kids, the fucking secure job, and they want to retire. Please be my guest. Please, please do that. If you feel like that's what you want, please do that. I just don't fucking want it. I want to be that cunt that has a house on wheels. <laughs> I just want to be that guy. I don't, I've always wanted to be that guy. I've always wanted it. I've, I fucking have a similar story to Andrew Tate. I grew up from not a lot of money, fucking parents always fighting about bills, all this sort of shit, having to like fend for ourselves at a very young age. And it pissed me off. It pissed me off that this motherfucker at the petrol station has a fucking Lamborghini and $500,000 on a car and I don't have 50 bucks to put to fucking food. Piss me the fuck off. It really does. Every, like every time, less so now because I'm on my way to earning that, but it really should annoy you. It should fucking piss you off. For me, it was, when I was younger, it was, yeah, I want the Range Rover and the family and yeah. I want the big house. And then it turned into, I had my daughter young, turned into, what the fuck? I, she's got a swimming carnival. Yeah. Because I was working at the pools as a lifeguard. Yeah. Swimming carnivals all the time. And only some parents come. She's got a swimming carnival. I want, what the fuck? I want to be able to go first steps. without saying something. First steps, first birthday, exactly. second birthday, exactly. third birthday. I want to be there for everything. Everything. If everything. If she doesn't want to go to school. I want to be like, all right, sweet, stay with me. Yeah, yeah. Come, come. Watch what Dad does on a day to day yeah. basis, and I'll teach you more about life in a day than I can in a year. At I school. don't want to have to ask for leave or take a sick day or. Please, sir, <laughs> can I have time off to see my family? And then possibly get knocked back because oh, we've got an important meeting this day. Seriously, got something on. You know what's a really interesting conversation? It's a freedom. Um, I had this. This, this actually, I, I have a very, very high disdain for authority that isn't earned. I'll put a caveat on the end. I've, I've had multiple, multiple, multiple jobs in my life. I've been fired from every single one of them. I fucking cannot work for people because there's this fucking 26-year-old cunt when I'm 19 that's been there for longer than me, has no better skills, but they tell me what to do. And in a really barbaric sort of yeah, way, there's people who I could flog the fuck out, out of that guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like physically, if this was back in the day when the Roman times, you would be bound down to me, motherfucker. Yeah, it, like was, that's, it wasn't. It was survival of the fittest, strongest man. Is the leader. Not the biggest cuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I got to a stage where I realized that working for people was not going to be my way to do things. And I even got into some trouble with my license and stuff like that, where I just like, you know what? I can physically drive a car, which means I can physically drive a car, whether the government tells me not to or not. And I end up spending 52 months off the road. It's a whole fucking story. You need to paint a lot of fines. Oh man, I had like nine grand in fines, some dumb shit. And um, if you want to listen to the full story, it's on heaps of podcasts that I've done. I've got a link in my bio. Um, but I got to a stage where I was like, I need to run my own business. I need to sort myself out and do my own thing. And so I started PT and I was working in a gym. So you're kind of running your own show, but you're still at the subject of the gym brand, basically. They pulled me into the staff meeting one day and um, I was good mates with the manager. She was a nice lady and she was nice to me at least. I don't, yeah, I don't really care about how she, how she was to anybody else. I've had some friends say some things, blah, blah, blah. But she was nice to me. If you're nice to me, I'd be nice to you. Respectful to me, respectful to you. If you're a cunt, I'm going to fucking put you in the ground. Like, this is just how it works. It's how it should work. Mm. Anyway, so she says, um, oh, we've had a complaint. I said, oh, about me? And she goes, yeah, I was really surprised to hear that. And she goes, um, it was swearing on the gym floor. And I said, well, do you mind telling me who it was so I can go apologize to them so I can say that I, I, I'm sorry I didn't mean to, like, put you into an uncomfortable place while you're at the gym, blah, blah, blah. I take my personal brand very seriously. And they said, no. I was like, they would, they would prefer to remain anonymous. And I said, well, how the fuck does that help me fucking fix the problem? And I literally said, I, I put a couple swear words in the sentence just to like really drive the point home. And they go, well, we can't give up their identity because they've asked to be blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is bullshit. I was like, this is my fault because I said something on the gym floor that I may have not otherwise needed to say. But I'm going to take the responsibility and make sure that this never happens again. Three weeks later, I quit. I was not in a position to quit. I, would, I was really not in a position to quit. <laughs> I'd just gone through what every PT listening to this, if there's personal trainers that listen to this, the Christmas hellfire period where a bunch of clients that were waiting to quit, but they see you every week. So they can't because they have to go through like the pain of telling you that they don't want to do the training anymore. They just don't come back after Christmas. It's a really easy excuse. They just never come back. I went through that period. I lost like 40% of my business. And because I was such a young PT, I didn't know that that was the case. And I was just like, oh fuck, this sucks. And I was earning like 40% less, obviously and I had bills and rent and all this sort of shit. And I was kind of just getting by and I was like, I can't do it. 
I was like, fuck this place. I can't do it. I'm fucking leaving. Started up online coaching. And in May next year, I will have been doing that for two years. And it's the best fucking decision I ever made. Easily the best decision I ever made. It's given me so much opportunity. It's given me a lot of stress, a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a lot of anxiety around if I'm going to make my fucking rent next week or not. Now I'm in a completely different place. I'm earning 10 times the money I was ever earning as a PT. Easily. And I have all the freedom in the world. I want to go get a fucking steak dinner, I go get a steak dinner. Mm-hmm. If I, I want to train 13 times a week for a sport that I love, I do that. I want to see my missus in the morning and have breakfast with her in the morning at a cafe, I go and do that. Like if I want to take a day off, it doesn't exist. Do what you want. It doesn't exist, right? If I say weekends aren't for working, weekends aren't for working. It's not even taking a day off. It's just not working. To, like not yeah. doing the tasks today. Well, this is crazy, right? I fucking enjoy so much about what I do is that I work every single day because I fucking love doing it. And I wouldn't have it any other way because I enjoy it so much. And that's just one of the realities that when you get to do something within the personal freedom, like I hate the idea of retiring and sip, sitting on the beach, drinking fucking mojitos and all that gay shit. How long is that really going to last? Why is that your idealistic version of retirement? Mm. My idealistic version of retirement is me still doing the things that I'm doing. I feel like I'm retired. I'm not having to. Exactly. Yeah. Not having to, not having this authoritarian thing on top of your face and saying, oh, you have to do this. Your paperwork's due by Friday. Fuck off. And then they're sitting there in the fucking office going, oh, that guy wishes he was me. I drive a I-series BMW. It's like, fuck off, dickhead. Who are you? Mm. I, I just, I couldn't stand, I couldn't hack it. And I'm willing to say that, but it's, it's been a fucking awesome journey being able to just back yourself and go, you know what? Fuck it. I don't like this. I'm going to take the responsibility and I'm going to create what I want. I'm not sitting there going, oh, my boss is a dickhead. What does that help? It helps nothing. It it's the same as you, right? You, you realize that that's not the way that you want to live your life. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to transition out of this. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to do what is necessary. And I'm going to do what I need to, to make it a better life. Mm. All fucking power to you, man. Like I literally just met you, but I can see that fire in a lot of people. And I'm a very good judge of character. And it, if it's there, it's there. But you'll do what's fucking necessary. It doesn't matter how many times you get knocked back because it's still better than that fucking boss that you hate hanging over your head. Like the failure doing your own shit, I say this all the time. If I end up fucking up my business in some crazy fashion, I stop doing all the work that I do every single day that I love and I end up earning 300 bucks a week and I failed, at least I fucking failed doing what I wanted to, not what I fucking didn't want to. If I was earning 15 grand a week stacking shelves at Woolies, I'd be depressed. I would. I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to train as much as I want to train. I'd have nicer things. I'd drive a nicer car. I would be fucking depressed. You'd be driving past that BJJ gym at nighttime <sighs> thinking, oh, I wish I could have went. I'd be stinging. Yeah. I'd be driving past jiu-jitsu at 9 p.m. and they just finished. I'd see the boys walking out of training. I'd be like, Get fuck. home, watch Instagram stories of the training session. Exactly. It's fucking bullshit. But yeah, the, do, do what you say, say what you do is a big thing for me. But always take a risk on yourself. Always. I've never, I've never had a period in my life where I backed myself and I regretted it. Never, not once. So what's next for you? Apart from the daily things you're going to keep on doing, is there a competition coming up that you're going to win? Uh, actually, yeah, I'm competing next next Sunday, uh, Wollongong Wars. I don't know if it's going to be live streamed or not, but it's against it's a super fight against a decent opponent. Um, I'm going to bash the fuck out of him. He's not decent. <laughs> um, Are these ones just like? Just one-offs for money or are they um, to, are they ranking? System? Not really. There's no real ranking system in Jiu-Jitsu unless you're like competing in America very often. They have like flow grappling rankings and stuff like that. Um, these are just me getting my feet wet in competition. I've only been doing the sport for two years. I haven't competed in Jiu-Jitsu a lot, which means tactically there's some things I need to fix up. And my only solution to that is to completely and utterly act as much as possible, which means competing as much as possible. Um, Where you can lose. And it's fun for me, man. Like, it's fun. I love having an expression of what I do every single day be able to be expressed through the method of competition. Like, I put in fucking... I put in more hours than anybody. Uh, Like, I put in all the hours. And it's really cool to get a, a reward from that. It's not why I do it, but it's a nice thing that moves the needle that's confirmation of what I'm doing is correct. And these go to your... Like, is there a professional record? Um... Yeah, eventually, when you get to black belt, I think they take that more seriously. Like, right. colored belts, they don't really care. Okay. Um, like, there's colored belt so world like titles and stuff like that, but it's not really like boxing or MMA. or to pro. Not really. Okay. No, not really. We're not exactly really a professional sport, to be completely honest. It's still in its infancy. So it's not really... That's why there's huge discrepancies in techniques. That's why Gordon Ryan can beat everybody. And they're like, what the fuck? And they're like, what the fuck? But it's like, Tiger Woods was the first person to ever introduce gym training to golf. 
look how fucking far he took the sport. He's the GOAT. Michael Jordan was one of those crazy people who did all the extras and looked after his body and did all that sort of stuff back in the 80s when the guys were still smoking cigarettes. Look where he took the sport. Even though he still was. Yeah, even cigars. though he's smoking cigars and stuff like a little bit different to cigarettes and stuff like that. But um, yeah, yeah, there's, there's just these people in the infancy of sports or like when they're starting to develop or really pick up and start to take professionalism really seriously. There's, there's outliers um, and it's the people who do take it professionally and seriously. And they're, they're always the ones who outperform everybody because they're doing extra work. It's very, very simple. But it, it's not one of these things where I don't want to have this message be misconstrued as the grind mindset, like Gary Vee being a fucking complete fuckwit. You don't like him? I fucking hate Gary Vee. I like him. I hate Gary Vee. Do you listen to his long form butt? I can't. I can't. I just don't like him. I think there's a, you got to, like you graduate from him. He's a good entry. Mm. He was my entry into right. start personal development, right. thinking about business. And then there's a point where the message is, Kind of the same. It's very engaging content. He's trying to reach, you know, everyone. Yeah, of course. So you kind of graduate from him. It's like, all right, you start building that accountability. The things yeah. he keeps pushing. And My stipulation right. on him is that the whole like wine business story, like their wine business was doing like three to six mil per year already. It's like this big fabricated story where it was fucking struggling and he took it online and all that sort of stuff. It was like a big dot-com boom. And don't get me wrong, there's still effort and energy and intensity. And he knows something that I don't about making $60 million a year. He does. But I think it's a little bit disingenuous around the way that it's purported. And I think the whole like, go to your basement, find all your baseball cards, sell them for 13 cents each, make $13. Is that the way you're going to get rich? No, because what's the opportunity cost? Think about it like this. Those people that the, uh, look, they're bums, they're, home, they're homeless people, whatever. They have to do what they have to do to survive. How many cans can you collect to make $20? It's like 200 cans, right? How long is that going to take you? Mm, yeah. Three hours? It's still $20 but it's going to take you three hours. What is that? It's less than $7 an hour. What's the opportunity cost? The opportunity cost is three hours. I think his way of doing that, but is more just to show that for those people who say, oh, I don't have money. I was like, all right, if you want to get money sure. and you have no money, do this and then, you know, graduate and yeah, go to the next thing. Of course. But I also come from the belief that if you're going to do something, do it right. Don't start doing it at, at one of those ways that is going to be inconsequential to the way that you do it in the future. Mm. So if you think about high leverage opportunities, you don't think about selling all those things. You think about developing skills yep, yep. so that you can then leverage those skills over a long enough period of time. Yeah, like I have the ability to leverage my skills from 11 years of gym training into this very minute direct path that people can follow that they don't have to go through the same 11 years that I did. I get to now leverage those skills for lots more money than I put into investing into getting them because of that. Yeah, it's one of those things. So I think if you're like thinking about low cost opportunities and selling stuff like that, I know we're going on a big tangent on Gary Vee, but thinking about like those low cost opportunities will get you low cost opportunities. If you're thinking about high leverage stuff, like how can I upskill myself to become more valuable in a society, in a community, in a niche, then I think that's always going to serve you a lot better. And it's not to say that he's completely wrong. I just don't like the fucking way he messages it. Yeah. 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 That, that's the way I see it. But again, he knows something more than I do about earning shitloads of million dollars. So will he still have something to teach me? Sure. But am I going to learn it from somebody else that I like? Probably. Yeah. 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 I think that's a lot to say about like the, char the character of people. You gel with certain people. You don't gel with other people. It's just the schematics of human nature. Like you're not going to agree with everybody on everything. You're not going to like everybody. Some people's face, you just don't like. Like- Change your face for me. Oh, you can't. Okay, well, we won't fucking hang out then. <laughs> yeah. It's very, very simple. Yeah. You have natural aptitudes to different people. And it's it's interesting because social dynamics is very interesting. Like we get along just fine. We just fucking literally just met each other. Yeah. Like, but I think it's, it goes back to the thing I said before. Is like you show respect, you get respect. You show kindness, you get kindness. If you're a cunt, you get cunt. It's pretty simple. The, the gross majority of people who think the world is a terrible place are terrible people because they think people are trying to nickel and dime them, and grime them and stuff like that. Well, funny that that's what you're trying to do to people. So no wonder you're fucking getting that experience out of life. But that's that's where Tate's thing comes into it. Is again, again, he goes, if you're a fucking good person, you show up with a good handshake, you fucking look people in the eyes, you speak about high level concepts, you think about, you don't bitch and brag and moan and gossip. You put fucking hard work into everything you do. You do it very consistently. You do it to the highest level that you can for the skill set that you have. You'll have everything. How could you not? Mm. I just think it's a fucking personal responsibility story that's so cool. Um, and people give him a lot of shit because of the misogyny so I wouldn't fucking go into that but um, again they probably don't like his face or they don't like his the way he speaks yeah. or they and don't they like can, his accent that's okay yeah exactly and, and that's okay because you weren't going to listen to the message anyway if you can't get past the fucking facial features so yeah oh, look look, I'm willing to concede on my point on Gary Vee I just don't like the way he speaks <laughs> not wrong with that yeah exactly right I'm guessing you like Joe Rogan and uh, big Rogan fan 
I'm excited for the day that you're on the podcast. I'll be watching. Hopefully, man. Hopefully. I mean, if I, I, I keep doing excellent things, I don't see why not. I mm-hmm. think I see like that could definitely be inevitable. And I think I have a pretty good message that I spread to people that are willing to hear it. And I think yeah. there's a lot of value in this and the podcast you're doing. So where can everyone find you? Uh, everyone can find me at HPU Coaching on Instagram and TikTok. I don't use Facebook or anything like that. Um, I have a HPU podcast called Mindset King. That's what I'm starting to do as now. They're short form podcasts. You can listen on the drive home. They're 10, 15 minutes of me just having autistic caffeinated rambles for <laughs> for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much how I get down and, and what I do. And you can see me on the BJJ scene and um, winning comps and fucking bashing people. <laughs>